All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this village board meeting to order on Tuesday, January 16, 2024, and ask if you would all please rise and join the village board in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Grassi? Here. Trustee Labetz? Here. Trustee Schwingbeck? Here. Trustee Baldino? Here. Trustee Bertucci? Here. Trustee Dunnington? Here. Trustee Shirley? Here. Trustee Tenalia? Here. President Hayes? Here. First item on the agenda is the approval of minutes, and we have one set to approve tonight from our village board meeting of December 18, 2023. Any changes or passes? I'll move to approve the village board meeting minutes from December 18th, 2023. Second. Motion by Trustee uh, Grassi, second by Trustee Tenalia. Any questions or comments from the board? Anything from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Next, we have uh, two warrant registers to approve under the approval of accounts payable, and I call on Trustee Bertucci. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I move approval of the warrant register for the check date 12 2023 in the amount of Four million seven hundred thirty-six thousand three hundred eighty-eight dollars and fifty-five cents. Second. Motion by Trustee Bertucci. Second by Trustee Schwingbeck. Any questions or comments from the board? <clears throat> Think from the audience. We do a roll call on these. I can't agree. Come on, warrants. Yes, you do. Yeah, roll call. <laughs> it's been so long since we had a meeting. <laughs> roll call. Trustee Bertucci. Yes. Trustee Schwingbeck. Yes. Trustee Baldino? Yes. Trustee Dunnington? Yes. Trustee Labetz? Yes. Trustee Tenalia? Yes. Trustee Grassi? Yes. Trustee Shirley? Yes. President Hayes? Yes. Uh, Trustee Berducci? I'll also uh, move approval of the warrant register for the check dated 1-15-2024 in the amount of $3,543,000. Thousand three hundred fifty-eight dollars and twenty-two cents. Second. second. Motion by Trustee Bertucci. Second by Trustee Labeds. Anything from the board or the audience? Seeing none. Roll call. Trustee Bertucci. Yes. Trustee Labeds. Yes. Trustee Dunnington. Yes. Trustee Schwingbeck. Yes. Trustee Tenalia. Yes. Trustee Grassi. Yes. Trustee Shirley. Yes. Trustee Baldino. Yes. President Hayes. Yes. <clears throat> there are no recognitions or presentations this evening, so we'll move on to citizens <clears throat> to be heard. And I have no blue cards from individuals who want to speak on an item not on the agenda. Correct, Becky? As far as okay. I know, yes. So let me just ask again, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on an item not on the agenda? All right, seeing none, we'll close that portion of the agenda and move on to old business. And we do have one item to report out from our committee of the whole meeting from earlier this evening. And I'll call on Trustee Leveds. Thank you, Mayor Hayes. I move now, as I did a little while ago, to concur in the mayor's appointment of Dave Losavio for appointment to the Housing Commission with a term ending April 30th, 2026. Second. Motion by Trustee Labed, second by Trustee Schwingbeck. Any further questions or comments from the board or from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, Dave, if you come forward to the podium, and we'll make it official. If you please raise your right hand and repeat after me, I and state your full name. I, David S. Losavio. Having been appointed to the Housing Commission. Having been appointed to the Housing Commission. In the village of Arlington Heights. In the village of Arlington Heights. In the county of Cook. In the county of Cook. Do solemnly swear and affirm. Do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the office according to the best of my ability. Of the office according to the best of my ability. Congratulations, Dave. We know you will. I'm going to present you with the Village logo pin to uh, wear proudly as a representative of this board and this community. And also, if I could have you sign your oath uh, with the village clerk to make it further official. So congratulations Thank again. You. Good luck. Congratulations. All right, there is no other old business, so we'll move on the, to the consent agenda. 
Are there any members of the board who wish to remove an item on the consent agenda? I do have a uh, request from uh, Mr. Moons to remove consent legal B. That's the uh, waiver of fees for government agencies. Uh, patent PTA. Oh. Yeah. Right? Well, B is legal B. Uh, legal B, legal Maybe B. Maybe the fees for government legal agencies. Legal B, the ordinance fees for government agencies. Okay, yeah. got it. So that shall be removed. Uh, are there, um, is there anyone on the board who wishes to vote no or pass on any remaining item on the consent agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the remaining items. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Trustee Baldino, second by Trustee Dunnington. Roll call. Trustee Baldino? Yes. Trustee Dunnington? Yes. Trustee Lavedz? Yes. Trustee Shirley? Yes. Trustee Bertucci? Yes. Trustee Grassi? Yes. Trustee Tenalia? Yes. Trustee Schwingbeck? Yes. President Hayes? Yes. I hope if we go ahead and take this uh, legal item now, can I have a motion to take that out of order? So moved. The one that we just removed? Second. All right, there's a motion by Trustee Tenalia, seconded by Trustee Bertucci, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Mr. Recklaus, you want to talk about that sure. one? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as you all know, when um, other sister government agencies do any kind of work within the village that requires some kind of fee or they apply for any kind of you know permit, uh, we have a long history of waiving those fees for like the library or the school district or the park district. And what typically is done is we bring those items before the board for a, a vote on a waiver. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, an extra step in the process. The village has never not waived a fee for, um, for one of those entities. And the only exception is when we have a situation where we have, as part of some kind of review, we have to, to incur extra costs to do an extra review with a consultant or something, we would generally just pass those costs on to the entity. And the logic behind this is that we're all serving the same taxpayers, and so the idea of you know essentially taking money out of one of the taxpayers' pockets and putting in the other one, um, it, it seems kind of counterintuitive. What this um, ordinance does is it codifies that long-standing practice um, this would apply to basically all of our fees, again, as long as the fee doesn't relate to the re reimbursement of extraordinary costs that the village would have to incur. Um, and so we're, we're recommending approval of this ordinance as just a time-saving efficiency uh, measure. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Moons, do you, does that address your concerns? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so um, if no other questions or comments from the board or the audience, I'd entertain a motion to approve the ordinance. Motion to approve the ordinance uh, pertaining to the permanent waiving of fees for government agencies. Second. second. Motion by Trustee Schwingbeck, second by Trustee Baldino. This is an ordinance, so uh, all those in favor, no? Roll call. A roll call, I'm sorry. Trustee Swingbeck? Yes. Trustee Baldino? Yes. Trustee Bertucci? Yes. Trustee Grassi? Yes. Trustee Labeds? Yes. Trustee Shirley? Yes. Trustee Tenalia? Yes. Trustee Dunnington? <clears throat> yes. President Hayes? Yes. All right, then we would move on to new business, and we do have a couple of items under new business tonight. First is a request by Chase Bank. And they requested action, a special use permit for a drive through and an amendment to rezoning ordinance to eliminate uh, section two in its entirety of ordinance 84-10 and associated variations for the property to be located at 585 East Palatine Road. Is there a petitioner present? Come on forward. And just uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you're looking to do here. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Krisoff, uh, I'm the market director of real estate for JP Morgan Chase Bank. Thank you so much. Um, just wanna quickly uh, say thank you for having us. I think we went through a pretty in-depth presentation at the uh, the Plan Commission Design Review Committee. Um, I think, uh, you know, basically this is just represents um, investment into our network, kind of transforming our network, optimizing it, and kind of bringing us into the future. Uh, we have pretty, two old facilities, one in Palatine and then one on Arlington Heights Road in Rand. Um, and we kind of, you know, they're the old Chase Banks where uh, 
transaction centers more than advice centers, big teller lines, uh, uh, very few private offices, and we're going to go into more private offices, more consultative selling, uh, uh, glass uh, uh, conference rooms, uh, public and private meeting spaces, th things like that. Fewer probably visits, uh, very, few, it's very small teller line, fewer ATMs, things like that, fewer transactions, but more uh, sit down, glass private offices, those kind of, those kind of meetings. So um, we have the whole team here. I've got our, our whole a group from uh, the Architects Partnership, our, our architect of record. We have our civil engineers, and we're here to answer any specific questions, but I'll let, I'll let staff talk about the, uh, the project. If they have any questions, we're here to answer them. Okay, yeah, Thank before you. we go to the board for questions from staff, go ahead. Um, I can make a, a brief presentation. Do you want to walk through your presentation no, first? No, why don't you go, why don't you go and then we'll, okay. we're here to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, pinch hitting for Charles. So I hope to do as uh, good a job as he always does. Um, so we have uh, Plan Commission uh, 230014, the Chase Bank with drive through um, for your consideration tonight. It's at 585 East Palatine Road. Uh, it falls within the B2 General Business District, which is allowed as a permitted use um, it, within the district. It's And the comprehensive plan it is, uh, identifies it as commercial, which is consistent uh, with that as well. Uh, the two requested actions tonight are a special use permit for a drive-through in the B2 General Business District and an amendment to the rezoning ordinance uh, 84-10 to, to eliminate section two in its entirety. And section two is basically to meet the design proposal from that 1984 rezoning into the B2 District. There's also a variation required in, uh, to Chapter 8, 28 of the Municipal Code to allow an accessory structure outside of the rear yard, which in this case is the, um, the, the overhang in the drive through So the aerial uh, shows the approximate area of where the applicant is proposing the new bank. Um, this is the site of the AT&T uh, wireless building uh, as it is now. So the, demol the building will be demolished It'll be a smaller footprint building that replaces it, uh, replaces it at the intersection of East Palatine Road and East Rand Road. Um, it's adjacent to the North Point Shopping Center, but this is a separate parcel, so it's not associated with the planned unit development uh, with, a, with a larger shopping area, although there's an easement within that shopping area to allow for access to the property from the major roadways. There's no direct access to the roadways itself. Uh, the site plan that they have is proposing, <clears throat> uh, as I described, the smaller footprint building um, that, that is there now. Um, it's a rather modern building design that's going to feature a number of lead features, which are sustainability elements. Um, <clears throat> amongst the recommendations and requests and enhancement uh, from the staff was a sidewalk uh, that is 10 foot wide in uh, width to allow for a mixed use uh, mixed use, I'm sorry, multi-use path uh, that's consistent with our bike plan. Um, staff supports the variation that's requested, uh, including the accessory structure, which does not exceed 10 feet, and it shields customers from inclement weather when they're using the drive through um, You can see on the, the screen the sidewalk enhancement and easements. Uh, they could potentially uh, run into the applicant's property. We're asking for easements where that is necessary. Uh, when they finally go to permit. And also the accessory structure variation you'll see is just the, the overhang in the drive through <clears throat> uh, Discussion on the sidewalk also involved a focal point area, which you see in the red and the green on your screen. Um, that's a streetscape enhancement and also the crosswalks that are leading uh, across the roadway, uh, we've been involved with the Rand Road enhancements as part of the TIF district, and we're asking the applicant to enhance the crosswalks as I've shown here, but if there are modifications that come out of our designs that are underway at this point, that they modify those to match as well. Uh, the landscape plan here uh, indicates some of the enhancements we've asked for, which includes uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit of additional streetscaping and landscaping, um, street trees that enhance the sidewalk and multi proposed multi-use path. 
Uh, the green uh, trees that are highlighted here are a set of junipers we're asking to be replaced with some uh, upright evergreen trees so they can shield the um, uh, the garbage pickup area. So that's screened from view uh, from the street. Um, also, there's going to be green elements that filter some of the stormwater before it makes it into uh, the drainage systems, which I'll, I'll highlight in the utility plan. Um, as you see here, the large boxes underneath the parking areas are actually underground vaults uh, in the drive aisles. Uh, these will store all the stormwater after it passes through some of the green infrastructure elements that are proposed. Um, there are a few engineering details that need to be worked out. Uh, including how some of the existing services will be capped, and final calculations for the restrictor on the underground vaults. Um, lastly, uh, the parking and traffic. Um, the site is well served by the two major roadways um, and uh, does not over, overwhelm either of the intersections. Uh, they should be able to accommodate the traffic um, quite easily. Uh, the proposed building, again, is a, is a, a large decrease from the existing footprint. Uh, that's positive from a number uh, of elements, including the, the storm, less stormwater generation, but also the site was generally overparked. Um, and through our uh, deliberation with the plan commission, we actually actually asked them to reduce the parking from 34 spots to 29 spots, again conserving more green space, and um, uh, with plenty of parking to accommodate the uses that have been described. Um, the drive-through stacking is also. Um, uh, allows up to 13 cars, which is plenty to accommodate um, what's been proposed there. So at this time, uh, we recommend approval. Uh, and the Planning Commission voted 7-0 um, to recommend approval for the application, subject to the eight conditions you see in front of you. Uh, staff is recommending that number four uh, be eliminated, um, that some of the engineering details that I briefly described before could be worked out before they get permit. And that concludes my presentation. Michael, can you just go back to the diagram that showed the, uh, yeah, that one. Yes. I just want to make sure I understand the drive-through aisle and where the stacking is going to be. Yes. Maybe this is going to be my bank. And so I'm <laughs> primarily concerned about where I'm going to uh, be going when I go there once it's yes. built. But uh, can you just describe that? I'm not, I'm not really following sure. the flow there. So on the, the left-hand side of the site, uh, you can come in through there. And then you would take a right into the drive-through lane. So the drive aisles would allow stacking into the two drive-through lanes. If you come in through the far right-hand parking, you would have to loop around into the drive, into the, um, into the opposite way. So there's, from the drive aisles themselves, stacking back into the uh, parking lot, you'd have 13 spaces before it backed into the common driveway uh, with the shopping center. That's the yeah, I, I understand. It just seems a little bit goofy uh, with respect to the everything on the right there. So you're saying someone might come in that right-hand driveway, go to the left, and then make a quick hard right? I believe. Let me double check. Go back into here. Yes. So they, that would be an exit only. Pardon me. So the right driveway would be an exit only. Yeah. So this shows it a little bit better. And since it's a double stack lane, it would allow six cars, uh, six to seven cars on each aisle as they come through. This shows a little bit. You can kind of see the shadow of the cars stacking up. There are some parking spaces on the bottom of the site plan. Um, those are preferably be reserved for employees because those are those are not easily navigated. If there is a um, a backup in the, a stack in the in the drive through, and um, you know, that's the board pleasure to make those restricted for uh, for staff um, that can be done. Um, but yes, so that would be an exit loop. Okay, so, that that makes more sense if yes. that's an exit. Sorry only. about that. <laughs> okay, no problem. All right, any other questions from the board? Anything? Anything from the audience? Do we have a motion? <clears throat> Uh, Trustee Levez. <laughs> Might as well get going. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would move approval of the um, uh, request to um, build the Chase Bank at this location, uh, subject uh, approval of the uh, plan commission recommendation um, with one, two, and three, then five, six, seven, and eight conditions. Right. Second. 
Motion by Trustee Labed, second by Trustee uh, Grassi. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments from the board or the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, that was painless, so congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, good luck to you. And we have one other item on new business. That's the Christian Pre-K Daycare uh, to be located at 308 North Evergreen Avenue. This is a request for land use variation to allow a daycare center in the R7 zoning district and a special use permit for a daycare center in the B2 zoning district and associated variation. So if you just give us your name and tell us what you're looking to do here. Hi, my name is Melissa Gilland. And I'm looking to move into the, well, we presently are under a provisional license, um, certified with DCFS, and um, Village Preschool operated there for 40 years. Um, we signed a lease um, and are hoping to be there for not quite 40 years, but, <laughs> you know, a while. Um, we have 45 <coughs> families between Monday and Friday, and I have a preschool director and three part-time teachers, not including myself. Whoa. Um, you can advance them, there you go, thank you. I'm sorry? No, I'm sorry, you got it. Okay. Um, my two cute dogs, my two cute sons. Um, <laughs> I've um, been in child care, believe it or not, since I was about eight years old, helping take care of children. So it's been a lifelong passion of mine. And um, there's a national shortage right now of early childhood centers and teachers. So um, I don't know. And I love Arlington Heights. I've been in here for over 20 years. Um, we are located where Village Preschool used to be, um, St. John's Church, right across from the North School Park. Um, the children and the teachers use um, three rooms, um, two of which are classrooms, and one is a motor room and music room. And then uh, 119 is the... Um, big messy teacher room <laughs> where the teachers lounge. Um, this is what village, where village preschool used to be. Um, I think that's the motor room, the, the empty room that you see. And then, um, I don't know, we filled it with books and kids and games and it, it's been great. We've been there since September, and it's, I don't know, it's been great. Okay, anything but, else? All right, well, let me turn to the staff. Michael, anything on this one? Uh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll quickly just run through uh, the considerations. There we go. So the project site is at... <clears throat> 308 North Evergreen Avenue, um, site of St. John's Church. Uh, it is in a two districts, actually, uh, the B2 General Business District and the R7 Multifamily District. Uh, the comprehensive plan is, is um, a lot of institutional, which is consistent with what's there. Um, as was mentioned, there's two um, requested actions tonight, a land use variation <laughs> for daycare in the R7 District and the special use permit uh, within the B di B2 District. Um, there's also two variations, one to waive the requirement for a traffic and parking study, and also uh, to, to reduce the required parking from 137 to 50 spaces. So the aerial uh, outlines the site um, as it exists now. Obviously, the church is on the site. It's uh, bounded by St. James to the north, Dutton on the west, Eastman on the south, and Evergreen on the east, the southern parking lot is accessible from Evergreen and Eastman, has access to 25 spots, and the northern parking lot uh, also has 25 spots, which is only accessible from St. James. Uh, the site is split, uh, as was mentioned, into the two zoning districts. The B2 covers the lower third of the site, mostly the southern parking lot, but uh, and then the uh, top half of the site is the R7 multifamily district. Um, staff supports 
uh, the land use variation for the R7 and also the special use permit for the B2. Um, um, these are consistent with how the site has been used in the past. As was mentioned, there's a brief period where it was not a daycare, but for many years before that it was, and that's consistent uh, with the historical uses. Um, this is the floor plan of the basement area, which uh, is currently occupied and was a subject of the proceeded on risk agreement with the village um, some time ago, I believe it was about <coughs> two months ago. Um, it consists of three classrooms, an office, and there's uh, five employees that will facilitate the daycare of up to 25 children um, between three and six years old. Um, as was mentioned, it was a daycare for many years, so it's, it's built to facilitate that use. There's no uh, changes to the building or outside. There are some co-compliance issues with landscaping, but we'll be working with the property owner on that since it's, it's not really part and parcel with what's being recommended uh, with the reoccupation of these classroom spaces. And uh, the recreational spaces are actually across the street at North School Park. Uh, the parking site, there's a, uh, the petitioner requested a waiver of uh, the requirement for a traffic parking study. Staff is, uh, and the planning commission is supportive of this request. Um, and they provided a, a very detailed parking study, which basically showed that the two uses really do not overlap each other. The hours of operation are two different times of the day. So there really wasn't a concern when they provided the parking study on, uh, on it being exacerbated with the existing use. Um, uh, the petitioner also did, uh, when we looked at the parking requirements, uh, we broke that out and again took that to the same consideration that the two uses are happening at two different times. Um, the daycare really only requires eight parking spots. They have access to 50 uh, during the day and that's why we are, uh, and the plan commission recommended uh, approval of the variation from the 137 to the 50 parking spots. Um, so the plan commission voted 8-0 in favor of recommend approval of the land use, uh, um, of the special use permit, um, as well as the uh, land use variation and of course the two variations. All right, thanks Michael. Any questions or comments from the board? Trustee Schwingbeck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, good presentation. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, so you, in, your, in the uh, presentation that we got, um, uh, you're talking pre-K and kindergarten extension. Yes. So I think you said from the ages, is it three to six? Three to six, <clears throat> okay. yeah. And then uh, in there you said the curriculum uh, is designed to exceed District 25 kindergarten readiness. Right. Have, have you guys worked with District 25 at all uh, to develop your program or how, do, how, how have you made sure it exceeds those standards? So there's no state law that requires kids to be in school until they're six. Correct. And so with the great school system that we have in Arlington Heights, I want to make sure that the kids are ready going in there. They're assessed prior to kindergarten. So what we do is we teach Jolly Phonics, which is also taught in kindergarten. Um, and then just honestly, with my experience, I know what's expected going into kindergarten. So those expectations are what my, are my guidelines for assessing my kids by the end of the year. Okay. So about this time, January, February, is when I'm looking at the kids that are going into kindergarten um, and making sure that they're um, in line with being ready with counting, they have to recognize their numbers, they have to be able to count, they have to be able to write their numbers. I have an assessment that I just check off okay. and I make sure that when they go in, it, my goal is always to make sure that kids love school and they're not going to love school if they are not ready and they go in frustrated. Okay. So in kindergarten next year will be even a thousand times better because it'll be full day. Right. So the kids won't feel that pressure of getting everything done with, and the teachers too, within two and a half hours, which is what it is now. Okay. Um, also being very familiar with that area and the parking lot to the west that belongs to the church. 
uh, obviously not right now, but it, during the day, are you getting the kids outside for any activities? And if so, knowing that church, like I do, where, where do you take them? So um, if I heard you right, the parking lot to the west, I mean, that's not a great parking lot because it's like an almost an alley back there. The kids never go back there. Correct. So we just cross Evergreen. We have the orange cones outside. We have the beware of children, yellow signs. And then we just... Go into the park? Go into the park. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Trustee Baldino. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, really just one question. Uh, right here on the screen, uh, we see that the plan commission recommended that no more than 25 students at a time. Mm -hmm. But in your presentation, you said you were going to serve 40 families. I had a feeling that might come up. Yeah, and there was another thing that said 37 families. Yeah. So does that mean you're staggering classes? So, or? No. So I, it was 37, and as from the beginning of when we first created this presentation, I'm now at 45. I even have a new student starting tomorrow. Okay. But that's within Monday through Friday. So I have two students um, that only come on Fridays. That's two different families. So we're talking about 25 in one day, but throughout the week, I see 45 different families. Okay, so they're not all going to no. the daycare at the same time? No, no way. Okay, and that and that's, <laughs> well, I, that, that, now you understand my question. And so Absolutely. Is that, that's not going to be a problem then? No, okay. no. So just to give you an idea, when Village Preschool was there for 40 years, at one point, they had four classrooms. I only used three, including oh. the motor room. I have four, but that's a teacher lounge, right. not for the kids. They had four classrooms, and they had 40 kids in the morning and 40 in the afternoon. So it's a lot. I'm staying at 25, and that's just my personal preference prior to you guys having that be the maximum. Okay. And so if you do decide to expand at some point, you're going to come back and... Go through this process again? I I would. No, <laughs> okay. I, there, two other things would have to occur. The church would have to allow me to have more space, sure. and I would yeah. have to be able to hire more teachers. Okay. The whole purpose of this preschool being what it is and why I think it attracts families is I am not huge. I'm not a kinder care or, a, yeah. you know, th those are not bad places, but they're just much bigger. And I want that community feel. Sure. That sure. Okay. Thank you. That was welcome. that was my question. You're thank welcome. you. Trustee Bertucci. Uh, thank you. I my question is uh, kind of piggybacked because I had the same question, but then one step further is is there a state requirement for a ratio of teachers to students? Oh yeah. And what yeah. what do you, what is that? So and it also depends on age, also. Right. So Right now, I am well below what they require. I mean, I my student teacher ratio is between five and one and seven and one. Okay. For the ages that I have, it's ten and one. Got it. Got Twelve it. and one. If you get older and you have the three year olds in a different room and just five year olds, I th think it even goes up to sixteen and one. Okay. Okay, so you stay below that. Well, that, well below that. Well below. Okay, mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. all I get. Okay, you may have trustee Lebeds. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't know if you remember, uh, probably not, but I happened to stop I by. Do remember. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and um, when the church was having an open yep. house, yep. and because my children did go to village preschool many years ago, I was very interested in seeing what you were doing, and you were busy painting and decorating and, and, yep. and yep. getting ready for the kids. So I'm really glad to see you get to this point Thank you. where everything's going to be above board, you know, meet all the requirements that we have. I mean, little did I know that it didn't when back way back when when my kids were there. So, but I'm really glad to see this. I, I do have a question. Um, I guess it's sort of along the lines of, of not so much the number of children, but um, you, you said your hours are 9, 15 to 3, 30. Three thir so we have a kindergarten extension. Okay. I, when I opened the preschool, I didn't realize what a need was in the community. So 
I had, um, I've added probably 20% of my students have come after the school year started mm. um, because parents were calling. There was a, a teacher in the area that passed away one week before school. There um, are a couple of child care centers that parents were not happy with, so they pulled their children out of that to bring them over to me. Um, and there's the half-day kindergarten, which is just two and a half hours. So they come to me, eat lunch, and then have another three hours of kindergarten enrichment. Okay. So it, it is until 3.30. Okay. So do your, do your little younger children, like the three-year-olds, stay just till noonish, or do some of them also stay longer? There's options. Oh, okay. So they can stay until 12.30. Or two thirty. Okay. Since the kindergarten kids get there later, they get about there about noon, right after the eleven fifty pickup. They get there about noon and they have lunch and then they stay until three thirty. Okay. Okay. Now I, I understand it a little better. And um, there's always a need. Then uh, there has been for so long for quality mm -hmm. uh, preschool in in the community in all communities. So thank you for bringing this um, to Arlington Heights. Trustee Tenalia. Thanks, Mayor Hayes. Thanks for doing this. This is wonderful, and as you know, it's been there for a long time, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're you're getting involved in doing it. No, is there any relationship to Nancy Gillen from T District 25? She is my mother-in-law, and that's her son, my husband. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> yeah, and I think Anybody I tutored your me. son way back when. She taught all of my children at Olive, and she's yes. wonderful. She's think wonderful. I will pass that on. I think I tutored your son way back, when <laughs> right be, after uh, I, I was certified. I, I'm just thrilled that you're doing what Thank you're you. doing. I have one concern for you, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Passman here. If this petitioner, five years from now, three years from now, or whatever, felt like they could arrange a, a program with the church to add 10 more students, because I just happen to know how business sometimes goes mm -hmm. places that you mm -hmm. don't expect, what's their short path towards getting that accomplished? And is there anything we should be doing tonight to help protect her? Um, those are... I'll tell you those are two separate questions. The short path would be to seek an amendment to the special use. Assuming that the relief is granted, they'd seek an amendment to an ordinance that you would approve at your next meeting mm -hmm. to reflect whatever changes that they sought appropriate. Uh, anything we should be doing, um, unless you know, Mr. Lascado says a different recommendation, I would say no. I would say it would be a little speculative at this point to work in some different kind of or a unique kind of procedure. Uh, I think that we can process an amendment uh, on pretty short order if one comes through. Usually for applications like this where there's a, a special use, it's the initial review that you know generates the kind of good questions both the Planning Commission had and that the board has. So I would say our process should be sufficient to address that need if and when it arises. Okay, and, and, and would, you, would you say that there's any uh, concern down the road? Let, let's just pick a number. If it went up to 35, would there be something that you could explain or share that they would want to be mindful of whether uh, clearly it's not a parking issue right uh, so <laughs> is there something that they would want to be aware of keeping in the back of their mind mm -hmm. uh, probably you know, I think a lot with schools and daycares is drop off pick up off or operations I think what was explained there's a stagger there that allows everyone to get in and out without mm -hmm. sort of stepping on everyone's toes so I think that would probably be one of the one of the issues especially since the Parking lots are kind of bifurcated from each other. Mm -hmm. So you're really looking at 25 spots. So just how do you handle that turnover? I think those are those are some of the biggest issues we look at when we look at schools or, or daycares, um, sure. you know, primarily. Um, I think outside of that, the uses are really consistent, um, which, you know, was included in our recommendation here. Yeah. So, yeah, those are right. prob that's probably the big one. Great advice. Great advice. Just for you, food for thought for Thank the you. future. I just want to make sure you're successful and sometimes Thank things you. change. <laughs> So thanks for being here. Thank you. Hey, anybody else? Trustee Dennington. Thanks so much. I, there's definitely a need for preschool. So thank you for bringing this back to um, the church that it had been at for so many years. Um, I was just wondering if the students that do half-day kindergarten, do you provide transportation for them to get back and forth to school, or is that on their own? Um, both. OK. I um, have worked it out with the parents that they, depending on the days they come, um, 
Monday through Friday. There's one student that comes Monday through Friday. So I will pick her up at Patton a couple days and her parents are responsible for a couple days. Um, and that goes with, you know, some of the other students that attend two or three days a week. Um, what I have found out is that, of course, we live in a great community and the parents want to help each other. So they're carpooling. So uh, um, a lot of it has not been as difficult as they thought it would be in terms of dropping off and picking up. Even at 3.30, you know, when we're going to pick up the kids or they're being dropped off, um, I, I don't know. It, it just, it's, it's worked well. It's worked well with the parents helping and me not having to transport. And does that follow DCFS regulations? Absol absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I had to fill out a form, I had to submit a physical, I had to submit my driver's license, um, all to prove that I was able to drive transport. And, and there is a number, I don't know if this is kind of where you're going, there is a minimum and maximum in terms of I cannot bust them um, over, I would have to have a special license and, and approval for transporting more than what I'm doing right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, anybody else? Trustee Grassi. Uh, no, I'm ready to, oh, to make a motion, please. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to thank you for bringing this back to uh, St. John's Church. Uh, as, thank you. Uh, yeah. And I would move to approve uh, Christian Pre-K Daycare at 38, th 308 North Evergreen Avenue. Uh, I guess it's PC number 23-015, land use variation for daycare in R7 district, special use permit for daycare in B2 district with the variations we discussed. Second. Second. Our motion by Trustee Grassi, second by Trustee Tenalia. Any further questions or comments from the board? Anything from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Thank Good luck to you. Much. Thank you Thank for you. all you're doing. All right, there is no other new business, so we'll move on to legal. And we do have uh, one remaining item under legal. That's a, a proposed ordinance amending chapters 18 and 20 of the municipal code regarding unscheduled bus stops. Mr. Recklaus. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is an issue that's obviously been in the news quite a bit over the last several weeks. And one of the points I want to make is that this ordinance um, is really the, the issues that have been in the news really illuminated a gap that we had in our own ordinance in our village code where we don't have the ability currently to regulate <laughs> unscheduled bus stops. Um, while the issues of immigration are obviously you know, something that's generating this discussion in many ways, I, I don't want this ordinance to be misconstrued in any way as the village or staff weighing in on the broader issues of immigration that, that are being debated nationally, but more, they're, they're really just finding a way to regulate um, issues that may find ourselves at our doorstep. Um, and so that being said, we are gonna talk a little bit about what other communities have experienced just to help us better define what it is we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so what are we trying to address? What's driving this? Why are we talking about this? As I said, the issues that's kind of, that have illuminated this gap in our code been that the state of Texas has been sending unscheduled charter buses with migrant passengers to the city of Chicago for the past several months. Um, in response, the city established an intake facility to help arriving individuals and pass an ordinance regulating unscheduled bus arrivals. Since the adoption of that ordinance, Texas has kind of pivoted their what they've been doing and they've been um, seeing they've been sending these charter buses to uh, the suburbs. And a number of nearby communities have begun seeing unscheduled bus drop-offs of individuals chartered by the state of Texas as well. And so we've been in contact with our neighbors, understanding what their experiences are, understanding you know, what they've been doing or haven't been doing to address these issues. And, and so you know, I think it's important to define what we're trying to address. And unscheduled um, you know, drop-offs pose significant safety, humanitarian, and public health challenges for the individuals on the buses and logistical issues for the village. Um, what we're finding is that in many cases with the, the migrant buses, 
is they are dropping them off at train stations and they are generally providing for um, uh, transportation via train to the intake facility in Chicago. That's what's been happening by practice. But that could change at any time. And again, our ordinances don't protect us from anything else. Um, <clears throat> the village does not have the type of comprehensive wraparound services available that Chicago has to provide to incoming migrants if we were to find ourselves having to um, uh, handle them um, singularly. Um, and again, this issue's exposed that gap in our village code. So what ha why is having no ordinance a problem? Um, the village has no idea when any buses may arrive, meaning we're unable to plan for them. Um, while most of the drop-offs we're seeing are occurring at train stations, there is no guarantee, and we've seen this, that a bus arrival will correspond with a train schedule. And so you could have someone, a group of people dropped off in the middle of the night, um, inclement weather, which tonight is not very difficult to imagine, um, could pose a real health hazard for, for passengers with no food or water for an indefinite period of time. This is obviously a problem. From talking to our colleagues in other communities, we know that some of these folks on the migrant buses are arriving literally in shorts and flip-flops. And so you can imagine how that would go if you had to have an extended period of time exposed to the elements um, tonight, for example. Um, the other thing is, again, while many folks are given train tickets, some passengers uh, may not wish to take the train or they may not wish to go to an intake facility at all, meaning that they would be stranded, forcing the village to look, at, look to their needs in, in transportation. So that's why unscheduled arrivals like this are really problematic. Um, so what we're proposing is that any bus used for one-way transportation with at least 10 individuals that is not regularly scheduled, that they must submit an application to schedule an arrival at least five days in advance. And what we're calling those in the, in the code, in the ordinance, are inner city buses. Unscheduled inner city buses, as defined above, are prohibited. Um, the application that they file must provide for information on the bus, the number of passengers, who it was that ordered the bus, a written plan for how passengers would be transported to another location, cared for, fed, et cetera. Um, the buses must disembark within 30 minutes of the approved time in their application. Um, buses, uh, the default mechanism in our ordinance is buses would be directed to the Arlington Park train station. We feel like that's the location that we're, where we'd be best equipped to deal with a situation like this. They could apply for a different location, but they have to be approved in their application. Um, inner city buses must coordinate their passengers' transportation to an ultimate destination and must remain on the premises until all passengers have left or until the bus is, is excused by the village. Um, so what happens if someone doesn't follow these rules and they just show up? Um, violators, violations would be subject to a fine of $750 per passenger plus costs and impoundment of the bus itself. Um, so that's something we would be getting the authority to deal with if someone didn't follow what we feel are the reasonable rules uh, regulating, uh, um, you know, the arrival of these, these one-way unscheduled buses. So again, these regulations would apply to any one-way bus drop-off of passengers that's not scheduled, not just those involving migrants um, from out of state. Um, other notes on the migrant bus situation, because I know folks have questions, um, staff in the police and village manager's office have been in contact with our colleagues who have experienced these arrivals. We're hearing about them whenever it happens, and we are all comparing notes as we do on a variety of issues. We have discussed operational contingency plans in the event that arrivals do occur and must be managed locally in the short term. But again, we want to stress the village just simply does not possess the capability to manage the care and shelter of, of, of large numbers of individuals in the long term. Um, but Back to the issue of buses, um, tonight we're recommending approval of an ordinance amending chapters 18 and 20 of the municipal code regarding unscheduled bus stops. Happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Mr. Eckloss. Well, this really does address a gap in our village code to address a situation that's not of our own making. And so I'm um, very pleased with the recommendation that the staff has come forward to fill this gap and to address uh, both the humanitarian and health and safety concerns that um, unscheduled bus stops brings to or potentially could bring to our community. And so I think this is a, a really good way to address some of these concerns, uh, not just for the uh, passengers on the buses, but 
for our residents and our community as well. And so I'm definitely in favor of the proposed ordinance. So thank you for the hard work by our uh, staff and our village attorneys. And um, I think it's a, a really good way to address this problem. So Trustee Schwingbeck. Thank you, Mayor. R Randy, uh, I, I, I guess when I will look over this, and I have a few questions too, but it's, it's really stemming from no game plan at all when the migrants are coming into our country. I, it, it, it really, it's sad because there doesn't appear to be a game plan. We're trying to put one together now and push the problem back, say, to Texas or maybe at some point in time, Arizona. But there just doesn't seem to be a game plan from the time these folks arrive until they get to wherever they're going. And that, that's really sad. You know, I, I, you see on the news, and you alluded to it too, they're, yes, we're in cold months now, but they're being dropped off really with no way to handle these conditions. And, and to me, that, that is a, a sad situation. I'm glad we're, we're really thinking of, of, the, of the folks that are, that are coming up here, because that, that's extremely important. Um, I guess my question is, how does the state of Texas, or if this ever goes into another state, like Arizona, which is on the border, how do they know what, what our village and these other towns, how do they know we have an ordinance? What we've uh, heard from um, some of the folks that have feel that feel these kinds of arrivals and spoken to um, kind of the individuals on the bus that are representing the state of Texas is that um, after, if an ordinance is passed tonight, uh, we would write a letter containing the ordinance, um, including the ordinance, and send it to uh, certified mail to the, the uh, Texas Governor's Office and the Texas Office of Emergency Management. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming when they see that, then they're in most cases, not going to be dropping people off here. I that, would hope that's the case. That is, that is so far, and this is a very fluid situation, and this could change at any time. Um, so far, it appears that the state is avoiding communities that have um, any regulations because there's so many that have none. And, and you, you had indicated dropping off where there's train stations. I think, wasn't there a situation here recently where some buses tried to stop in Palatine, right? then they got supposedly diverted where they were going to go, they were supposed to go down to the city of Chicago, but they tried to go to Elk Grove Village. They Correct. got turned away there, and then I thought I had heard that they wound up in Wheaton. That's accurate. Okay. Because, I mean, again, we're thinking of these folks that have been brought up here all the way from the state of Texas and they just keep getting passed around like old luggage. I, I mean, this is, it's terrible. And I, I just think it's no game plan. On, on your sheet there that you had where you were setting some of the, uh, the guidelines, if you could go back to that, I think your first one on there was uh, one, uh, one, go forward, yeah, right there. Any bus used for one way, and we're only talking about buses that go inter, not not within, say, Palatine to Chicago. We're only talking about buses that are crossing state lines. Or, or do you want to? No, I'll, I'll address that. The ordinance is drafted to apply to any bus that comes one way into Arlington Heights from anywhere else. Okay. Whether that's two thousand miles away or three miles away, okay. Because and the problem, and, and the reason, if, if I may, Trustee Shreemak, is the problem is the same, no matter where the bus is coming from. That unscheduled, and as the manager mentioned, particularly on a night like tonight, as an example, poses a potential safety and health risk for the passengers, whoever they may be. And why at least ten? Why not none? Why? why I mean, what? What if they all of a sudden start? transporting them up here in smaller groups to bypass the ordinance. Why don't we just say any bus used for one-way transportation that's not regularly scheduled? Uh, two answers to that. First is that um, we start to run into issues with 
uh, vehicles like Uber and other ride sharing that are, are clearly not the same concern as a large group of people coming in at once. Uh, the other answer is if that becomes an issue, mm -hmm. if we start seeing unscheduled drop offs of people in groups less than 10, we can always come back and recommend additional changes to the ordinance. Okay. So, I, I do want to say one other thing, Trustee Schwingbeck, and it's to some of the points that both the mayor, manager, and you've made. Um, it, it's important to note that this ordinance is set up to be something of a game plan. It is not a prohibition on the transport of people in Darlington Heights. Right. Very deliberately not a prohibition. The whole intent is that if there are buses coming to Arlington Heights, that there is coordination so that those who are brought here can get on to wherever their destination is, be it in the community or elsewhere, safely and, and humanely. Uh, so I know it was a goal of staff as, as directed to our office to draft this in a way that does not, it, it's not putting up a stop sign. It's right. saying, let us know when you're coming. Give us five days and we can coordinate with you. Give us your plan for what you're going to do come during hours when we're here and we can assist regularly. And that's the, that's the kind of drop-off that staff believes, at least right now, that can be handled and managed in a way that gets the passengers, whoever they are, wherever they're coming from, to wherever it is they're going. Right. No, I, I, and I understood that, and I knew why we were doing it. My, my point on a lack of game plan is from the time they come over into our country until they get here. So I'm glad that we're putting forth a game plan because I, I think in a lot of cases, there's probably no game plan bringing them up here. So, thank you. Okay, anybody, Trustee Bertucci. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> Randy, in drafting this, I just have a couple questions. Um, actually, you and I have had conversations on the phone uh, probably before anybody was doing ordinances and just running scenarios in our mind would have and here we are now weeks to months later and this is happening so i appreciated all those conversations we used to have kind of a drill um so but anyways in looking at the ordinances the illinois municipal league recommendations so on and so forth is there anything in our ordinance that um was put in but was not very much seen in other other towns or the opposite that was not put in that many towns were putting in? The, the only, there, there is an issue um, that, I, to my knowledge, we may be the first one to, to add this, and, and I'll give uh, Assistant Manager McCoola credit for coming up with this when we were all brainstorming, was that the requirement that the bus uh, remain on the premises until everybody is, um, is, has left or until the, the village uh, you know, excuses them. Because um, that was a situation where we were thinking about scenarios where um, folks, even if they follow a plan, could just kind of dump them off. And if there was a problem with the train or a problem with other transportation, we still it still would present a potential issue. Um, that was one issue that was added. Um, I'm other than that, we really followed um, best practices in the region. Now, you know, next week there could be a slew of them that include something we haven't seen, but, uh, it, you know, currently I think this reflects kind of best practices that we've seen in the region. Okay, thank you. Okay, Trustee Baldino. Thank you, Mayor. One, one quick question. Uh, I was trying to read through the ordinance, read through here, um, and the question has to do with the uh, impoundment of the bus. Who decides if the bus is going to be impounded and what criteria are they going to use to, to make that determination? You, that would be something that um, would be subject to, to the discretion of police officers on the scene, just like um, any other um, law enforcement matter would be um, determined. You know, where there are certain scenarios now where vehicles can be impounded, similar standards would be used um, for those situations. Okay, so there are standards in place for making those decisions. Yeah, there's practices, that, that best practices in okay, law enforcement. So the police yeah. department is going to have a practice that yes. they put in Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Trustee Shirley. Um, yeah, I, I, for Harder, Randy, I just, I don't, I don't understand the definition of an unscheduled bus. Who is the master scheduler of buses in the country? Who has the authority to schedule a bus? You don't, you, you understand where I'm going? I mean, how do we know, un unscheduled by who? Uh, Trustee Shirley, the idea here is that this is meant to exclude buses like Pace. This is a bus that is coming. It, it can be scheduled for, for a variety of ways, but the, we, we have an exclusion for what's 
defined in the draft ordinance as regularly scheduled service, which is defined as bus service involving passengers disembarking the village on a predictable and recurring basis following a schedule published in advance and available to the general public and provide service in exchange for paying a fare. So uh, because we know that there are buses that come into Arlington Heights from our neighboring communities and then go back out again. The, the real focus here is a bus coming from outside our, our community, 10 or more people, that's not part of a service like that and just brings in people and drops them off. It, and it's, it, it also, one more thing, yeah. it's intended to cover one-way transportation. This does not cover round trip. For example, a bus that comes from a neighboring community school coming into town so that they can play a basketball game or, or, or attend a, a musical, that is not covered by the ordinance because that's not one-way transportation. That's a round trip transportation. Okay. Okay. It just seems a little like it, we're in a little dangerous zone there, but that's okay. Um, I, I just a comment is just that I wish we would take some action as a village to urge our politicians at the state and, and federal level to do something about this at its root. Um, it's not fair to us that we have to deal with this. Um, and uh, I see no, no indication from the city of Chicago or the state of Illinois that anybody wants to take ownership of this issue to say that we have a, a root problem um, at the border of the United States with Mexico. And it just seems shameful that everybody's running around asking for more money. That's what they're doing in Chicago and what they're doing in the state of Illinois instead of addressing the problem and actually enforcing the laws at our border. Um, the, the laws are very clear. Our federal government is, is choosing not to enforce those laws for whatever reason, I don't know, whatever reasons. But it just seems to be a shame that we have to deal with this. So I will definitely support this 100% because I think we have to take responsible action on this humanitarian level. But this is, this is absolutely out of control. It's nuts. There's no purpose to this. It's serving no one any good at all. And it's just a mess. It's, it's, it's an abomination. So that's all I have. Thanks. Trustee Labatt. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the hard work on, on this issue. Um, and I just have one question, and that has to do with the fines. So if um, a bus comes that hasn't been, you know, hasn't been properly notified, and so you don't know really where it comes from, how do you know where to send the fines to? Well, the, the bus itself um, would have to be, you know, have license plates and, and that type of thing. And so we would, we would be just like we would if, um, you know, you pull over a vehicle. And so we'd be looking at the registration like the police department can, and those would be the individuals getting the fines. Okay, so it's possible to, to actually do that. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Okay. Trustee Grassi. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to to just concur with many of my colleagues, especially uh, Mayor Hayes, with your initial response. I thank you for that. And I also wanted to thank the staff for putting together this proactive, welcoming ordinance that is really focusing on safety, our safety as residents and businesses, and also the safety of very vulnerable, suffering people who are being used as pawns, unfortunately. And, and I will add a, a couple of comments of my own. Um, the issue with, with migra migrants and our border issue is not anything we deal with at this level. It is not a cut and dry issue. It is very complex and nuanced. And we cannot control bad actors who are doing bad things by sending people here without the proper health care or clothes or food. But what we can control is a municipality is how we respond to those people who are needing help. We have a motto of, of being a village of good neighbors. We do not have, as, as Manager Reckless mentioned, we do not have the resources to provide them everything they need, but we can be a welcoming place of safety and humanitarianism and really support them as living human beings who are suffering and trying to find a better life. And I really appreciate this ordinance because it really is focusing on welcoming and encouraging people to come here with planned action on behalf of Governor Abbott at this time or whoever it may be, but we are saying with a scheduled ar arrival time, we can make sure to have the appropriate people and resources available to help these people. 
And I have to say how touched I was. I actually uh, received, I think some other people on the board did also, I received uh, some emails from some area faith communities who offered to, with a few days notice we may have, to also assist our community with welcoming with just basic needs for these human beings, just to, to welcome and assist with whatever needs there might be. So I am in complete support of this ordinance. I really thank the staff for the complexity of putting this together, but really focusing on the safety of us as a community, but also the safety of these, these people who are trying to find a better life, as we all hope for ourselves and our families. So thank you. Trustee Tenalia. Thanks, Mayor Hayes. And I agree with everything that has been said throughout the entire discussion. I appreciate all the hard work you guys did and, and the wording. This is, this is very carefully written and very carefully well thought out. And, um, you know, you can prepare for a lot of things as a community or as a home or as a village. You can't prepare for certain things that are beyond your control. And, and once in a while we get hit with fires, we get hit with terrible storms like we just did this weekend, and it's crazy difficult. And you find ways through it. This is something that, because of what you guys are putting together, we're becoming a little bit more prepared. Mm -hmm. little, and and, and we're, we're protecting <clears throat> both sides of, 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 of the field here. We have all the folks who need help and want help, and everyone that lives here and expects a certain type of representation. So I'm just thankful for what you guys have done, being proactive, and tonight hopefully we can get this accomplished. So thanks, great job. Okay, uh, Trustee Dennington. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate that we have to have this ordinance, um, but I do think that um, it has been crafted in a way that um, is really um, shows um, who we are as a community in that we're treating people with respect and kindness. Um, I, I have been con um, contacted by several groups that would be willing to help if um, there was a situation where migrants arrived. Um, people, There's a lot of people in the community that do wanna help and um, I, I do support this ordinance. <coughs> I think that it protects the village and the people on the bus. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Trustee Grassi. I'm ready to make a, a motion, please. I, I move to approve the ordinance amending chapters 18 and 20 of the municipal code regarding unscheduled bus stops. Second. Motion by Trustee Grassi, second by Trustee Tenalia. We do have two blue cards on this uh, agenda item, and first is from Sandy Brousseau. Sandy? And you're just reminded of the three minute time limit, if you would. Okay. I don't have to say much, actually. Okay. <laughs> but. Um, my name is Sandy Borso, and I'm, I'm a resident. I live on Wing Street here in Arlington Heights. And uh, after listening to this and reading about this uh, ordinance, uh, apparently it'll ensure that if buses carrying migrants and asylum seekers arrive here, they will be sent on their way to official landing sites where they can enter the system uh, we've heard that people on these buses are sometimes ill-prepared for our climate and may not have basics like food or water. That concerns many of us. As a member of Southminster Presbyterian Church, I'm aware of how the churches throughout this village have worked together on many social uh, issues, often as, often as part of their commitment to Matthew 25, which calls us to care for our brothers and sisters and to specifically welcome the stranger. With this in mind, I hope that the village will consider how volunteers can be part of the plan to respond with comfort and kindness as migrants and asy asylum seekers make their difficult journey. We, can, we can't fix all that is wrong with our current system as you've all alluded to here. Uh, but we can recognize the needs of our brothers and sisters and respond as they pass through. Therefore, I suggest you include representatives from several village churches who are willing to participate as you plan the specific responses to the arrival of bus uh, buses transporting migrants and uh, same asylum seekers, um, we're here. So please call on us. 
Well, Sandy, thank you for your comments and for your, especially for your offer of assistance. And we will certainly take note of that uh, if the assistance is required. So thank you very much. And, and last is Keith Moons. Thank you, President Hayes. I do appreciate it. Yes, this is a this is a heart wrenching problem. I think for everybody that's in this this room tonight. But in my opinion, this is an example of the village staff just overreacting to a non emergency. We've had exactly zero problems with this so far, and this is not a game plan. This ordinance is not a game plan to dovetail with something else. It's a deterrent for buses stopping here. That's in other towns have seen that, so they pass this ordinance and hope they stay away. This ordinance is a national origin discrimination, period. That's what this is. We are targeting a certain group. It has little to do with safety concerns, with gaps in the ordinance, filling in holes, nothing. It is targeting a certain, a certain group. These folks are in the US legally as asylum seekers. And they have every right, every legal right under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution to travel interstate and use public transportation without being labeled a public nuisance. They got enough problems. Instead, these folks need some help. They need it right now. We all realize that. They walked from Venezuela in flip-flops how determined can you get to get here? They're good people, I would assume. We are a village of good neighbors. We should provide some support and assistance here and not pass this knee-jerk ordinance that says stay away. And that's what this ordinance says. We could easily give them some aid and support for 20 to 100 people. That's what we're being asked to house and, and service, 20 to 100 people right here in the Taj Mahal. This building is 50% empty all the time. We could set up some intake process center here for them and be prepared. So if this, if this motion passes now, are we gonna set up an intake center to be prepared for buses to come in? Are we gonna have something organized for them for when they do show up? The answer is no to that. We're not gonna have anything prepared. We're really hoping this ordinance keeps them away. That's what the intention of this ordinance is. And so I would ask the Board of Trustees tonight to not rubber stamp this motion, this discriminatory motion, I mean this, this ordinance, the motion to approve the ordinance. But rather, let's follow the example of some towns like Glen Allen. They've said, we're not doing this. We're gonna organize and help this to occur. We're gonna take some role in this regional problem. And they have already received <laughs> many migrant buses, more than we'll ever see, probably. And Glen Allen's a little town. So I, again, I would ask that we pitch in in a humane way, either amend this motion to include things that also include setting up an intake center and being prepared. But we have no intention to do that, for my feeling. Our intentions is to hope they just stay away if we pass this <laughs> ordinance. Other towns have experienced that. If we pass an ordinance, the word gets out, don't stop here. And that's what we're hoping for here too. And it is not following in our good neighbor mode. Thank you, President Hayes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Moons. I would just disagree wholeheartedly with your assertion that this uh, ordinance is in any way discriminatory. I think it is clearly, as outlined in the staff memo and it has been discussed here this evening, humane in every way and clearly looks out for the uh, safety um, and uh, humanity of the passengers of the bus and of the residents of this community. So. Anyone else in the audience wish to address the board on this agenda item? Why don't you, you have to come forward if you wouldn't. Just give us your name. Hi, Dennis. Uh, yes, I guess what I don't understand is um, you're, you're asking that the buses be dropped to Arlington Park Station? Is that? that I, I don't know when, when you're co if someone coordinates this, right? What I'm missing is the Part B. So... Um, a bus, they comply with all the requests, the five days, the hoops and everything, and they're here. Um, what next? What do you have set in motion? What is your game plan once once they're here? Mr. Reckless, you want to talk about sure. that? Sure. Will everyone be? And, and I think a lot of people in the community would step in to help as well. What, you know, what we're seeing, you know, what is that right now, 
in the state of Illinois, there is one intake facility that um, in the case of migrants, folks are being directed to, and, and that's in the city of Chicago. There's another one being discussed that the state of Illinois would be opening as well. Um, in, the, in the case of migrants, asylum seekers, we feel the most appropriate place for them to go is a centralized location that has those comprehensive wraparound services. And we've been in contact with our colleagues throughout the area, and that's something that has been generally consistent. Some communities that have attempted to open those facilities have since, like Oak Park, um, pulled back from that because they realized they really didn't have the ability to provide those services well. And so we're looking at a state and a regional level where folks are supposed to go. So in the case of, of if it were migrants and asylum seekers that were, were coming in, um, again, the, the application would have to show a manner, okay, you're arriving in Arlington Heights, you know, let's say you're directed to the Arlington Park train station. Um, they would have to provide a mechanism to get those, all of those folks either, you know, housed somewhere, fed somewhere, whatever, or get them on transportation somewhere where they could get those things. And so the weather that, and what we're seeing in many communities in our, of our colleagues is folks will arrive. They generally arrive with train tickets in hand um, that are handed out for them to disembark and then go to Chicago. Metra has a process for identifying folks and then getting them to the intake facility. Some of the folks arrange for their own transportation. Some of them may have friends or family in the area, and rather than get on the train, they make arrangements to get their own transportation. In isolated cases, um, there are situations where the community, um, the host community, you know, in this case, Arlington Heights, would have to arrange for transportation to get them to an appropriate location, whether that be, you know, somewhere else or an intake facility or wherever they'd want to go. Those are isolated cases. But generally speaking, what we're finding is most folks are given train tickets and they take those train tickets so they can get to the intake facilities. Okay, so you, we, they, I, I don't understand who the they is, I guess. So it's that bus driver? The, they're, bus what, what we would be saying is anyone that's arranging a um, inner city unscheduled you know, but they, they would they would have to provide for a plan to do that. And that is generally what we're seeing is that um, in these cases, when we talk to our colleagues in the migrant bus situation, they are um, there's a bus driver and there's usually one other individual on the bus that kind of coordinates disembarking and, and um, you know, uh, secondary transportation. They hand out train tickets and and help them facilitate you know their arrival at another location. OK, we're going to have we're going to have to move on. Yeah. All right. Anyone else in the audience wish to address the board on this agenda item? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Anything further from the board? Roll call. Trustee Grassi? Yes. Trustee Tenalia? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Bertucci? Yes. Trustee Schwingback? Yes. Trustee Shirley? Yes. Trustee Baldino? Yes. Trustee Dunnington? Yes. Trustee Labetz? Yes. President Hayes? Yes. Okay, again, thank you to uh, the staff and uh, uh, Mr. Passman and his team for their hard work on this uh, very important ordinance. We have one other item on the agenda. That's the, under the report of the village manager. Um, and this is uh, options regarding Sounds of Summer for 2024. And just uh, preliminarily, uh, I've probably received more emails about this in the last couple of days than I have in the last three years about the Chicago Bears. And so I know it's uh, created a lot of discussion in the community, and that's a good thing. Um, and I could just rest, you can just rest assured that the Village Board is not in any way trying to kill this very successful Sound of Summer program. Uh, I've been on the board the entire time uh, that this program has been in existence, and it's been uh, very, very beneficial to our community and has been well uh, received and enjoyed by not just our residents, but residents from all over the area. And so we are not in any way trying to kill this program. Uh, in fact, this proposal extends the program and satisfies one of the concerns that I've heard for a long time is that it should run longer. And so uh, I would just uh, ask that you uh, listen to the rationale from the staff as to why this is even being proposed. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Recklaus. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, and this is not a new issue. This is an issue that we've discussed in meetings with the board um, back in May and then again in November. And I know, um, you know some of these issues were raised by trustees themselves. 
But um, staff would, tonight would like to make a recommendation on possible changes to the Sounds of Summer format. Um, Sounds of Summer, as you mentioned, has been a hallmark of downtown Erlang Heights experience for many, many years now. Um, it has evolved considerably over the years in terms of its size, scope, and its impact. It went from a, a one-day event, um, you know, with one day a week, to a two-day event that basically featured acoustic or, or you know, uh, local bands um, it, until recently didn't even require roads to be closed, if you can believe that, and that wasn't that long ago, um, to the, the major significant event that it is today. Um, our downtown has evolved as well, and with the tremendous growth of restaurant entertainment uses in recent years, assisted by Arlington El Fresco, the downtown is a different place than it was years ago. And what we're suggesting is that the Sounds of Summer concert series should continue to change with it. The concerts were created in part to help bring patrons to our downtown businesses. However, what we've learned is that our businesses' needs are different than what they once were. In addition, with the great crowds that we're routinely seeing in our downtown now, the logistics of holding downtown events have changed as well. And, and I, I wanna reiterate what the mayor said, that no one, nobody is suggesting that Sounds of Summer end or be shortened or to be diminished in any way. The question that we wanna talk about tonight is how do we best optimize this event to maximize the help we provide to our businesses while managing our resources well. The recommendation we're presenting tonight is not based on a single meeting. It's not based on some group vote. Um, it's not based on a single group's input or, or, or a single survey. It's based on many, many individual discussions that staff has had with downtown businesses over time. It's based on feedback we received anecdotally during the many virtual meetings we've had in recent years with downtown businesses during and after the pandemic, and also similar meetings we've had with downtown residents. It's based on more recent meetings we've had with the newly formed Downtown Arlington Heights Business Alliance, which is attended by businesses who are located immediately adjacent to Harmony Park. Um, and per the board's request, the Arlington Economic Alliance was consulted, and this group is tasked with primarily representing business interests in the community. They recently met and supported the recommendations that we're gonna outline um, for you tonight. Their meeting was open to the public and the Alliance received no questions or comments from attendees on the matter. But I also would note that the recommendations are also informed based on staff's observations and data, uh, which we haven't shown before tonight, which we're gonna summarize for you. And, and please know also that what we're, rec what we're recommending is just a recommendation. If the board prefers to continue with the status quo, you're not gonna hear any argument from us. Moreover, if you do agree with the staff recommendation, it absolutely can be an experiment for one year, meaning we can always go back to an old format or come up with a new one in future years. But with that, I'll turn things over to Assistant Village Manager uh, Makula, who's gonna kick things off. Thank you. Um, oops. Okay. Thank you, uh, Manager Recklaus. So as the Assistant Manager, I oversee the Integrated Services Department, and the department includes the Communications Unit, which oversees special events in the community, and we produce the special uh, the Sounds of Summer concert series. And with me tonight is Avis Mead and the Village's Communication and Outreach Coordinator. And we are here tonight to talk about the proposed modifications to the concert series. And I'd like to thank those that took the time to either call us or email us on, or note us on social uh, media as we appreciate all feedback. Something I'd like to share is that Avis and I absolutely love the Sounds of Summer concerts and take great pride in producing the event. We absolutely love it. We're out there working these events and we know how popular it is. It is a big event to produce and we know it is loved by the community and visitors. Uh, Arlington Heights is known for our concert series, and we know the spotlight is on this program. This is why we are always evaluating the program to make sure we share pinch points when we see them, to make sure we can continue to produce quality events uh, that are manageable by, to those attending and also manageable for those in the downtown and for the businesses and the residents that live there. We have a long-standing history of investments in our downtown district, 
in providing special events, receiving awards for our downtown, and we are having record attendance at our events, and these are all very good things. So at my budget presentation this past November, I shared current and anticipated challenges for my department, and I highlighted two specific initiatives. So you may recall there were two specific uh, ones that were related to events. The first one was that staff will be conducting review of community event management. And this is where we talked about the 19 events that staff um, does handle for the community, 12 of which are these Sounds of Summer events. And we are gonna be assessing um, and improving logistics and layout of our 19 events that we do manage. And the other initiative that I talked about in November was reviewing the Sounds of Summer concert format. And this is where we propose modifying going to Thursday night only rather than the back-to-back -back Thursday and Friday night concerts. And this is where the board told uh, or asked staff to do, uh, talk to the Economic Alliance and get their feedback as well. So uh, moving on to the slides that we have this evening, We'll take a walk through some of the history of the Sounds of Summer and how it's changed over the years. So <coughs> 2001, Sounds of Summer started on Fridays. Uh, it expanded to include some of the acoustic performance on Thursdays, and it did feature some of the small-scale bands. So Thursday nights were really intended to really just be some of the local bands, such as the Hersey Jazz Bands, and then eventually, um, you know, just some of the smaller local bands and you can see in the top picture there that the roads weren't closed. So you can see there when you look at the street that the cars are still there and in the, in the, in the, in the park really isn't uh, quite full yet. And so concerts prior to Arlington El Fresco were always popular, and, but the crowds were pretty much contained to the park th itself. And then moving on, um, you can see that where we are today that in 2021, there was a hiatus due to COVID. And then we kind of introduced Arlington Al Fresco. And at that point, um, you know, the village board made a significant investment in the downtown, and Al, Al Fresco really was a success story. And so we returned with 2022, and we had record setting, uh, setting numbers. People really wanted to be in our downtown, people wanted to uh, explore what was Arlington Al Fresco all about. So the expectation for bands really increased. Um, so we started booking bands that were larger on Thursdays and Fridays, and the popularity of Arlington Al Fresco just continued to grow. And we were setting record numbers both Thursdays and Fridays. And with that, we had such large crowds that really we started to see new types of challenges. And um, really that made us pause and say, what did we need to do differently? What did we need to analyze? How did we need to produce safe events to manage the crowds that we're attending? And so you're going to hear from Avis and from the rest of us this evening about what some of those challenges were, what we observed, and some of the data that we gathered um, over the past year to present to you this evening. Good evening. I can kind of take it a little bit from here for a while. Um, so Arlington, El Fresco, uh, I just want to kind of, um, Diana talked about how it changed the scope and of crowds and everything. So here we have some information from a company called Placer AI. We're going to introduce some of these stats tonight. So um, I'll dive into Placer AI in just one more slide, but I just want to compare during El Fresco time from May to September in 2019, we had 310,300 visits. And then May through September in 2023, we had 4, 400, 494,000 visits. So as you can see, just in general, the amount of crowds that come to a specific area, these are the types of things that we need to keep in mind as event hosts and managers and to assess and and to process any sort of changes that they might um, cause. So um, a little bit of Placer AI. So this is a, um, a tool that we have access to. It is a location analytics company. It extrapolates data to provide estimated attendance. It also has a partnership with 500 popular apps that people use on their phones so that they can actually use their data as well. Um, it's based on people that have a cell phone. Um, so just know that anytime we use the Placer AI data, it is the lowest possible amount of an estimate because it doesn't include people without cell phones. So um, I just wanted to give a little bit of insight about data. So, and, and that's the geolocation fencing that all of this information comes from, is that little area there. It includes Harmony Park and El Fresco. 
So Thursdays, we looked into all of our data and we tried to find some information about Thursdays versus Fridays. So Thursdays on average during al fresco, so this is May through September, but um, it actually, it's not including the last weekend of September, which is Harmony Fest. So that's an outlier and we didn't include that in this data. So during non of summer nights, we have approximately, well, a court, uh, cell phone users, 1,916 people. During Sounds of Summer, we have 3,717, and that's on Thursdays during Al Fresco. On Fridays during Al Fresco, this goes from on non Sounds of Summer nights from 3,755 people to 5,034 people. So there's actually, the math here shows a 93% increase on Thursday nights and a 34% increase on Friday nights. Um, and that is basically because it, it shows a bigger impact of concerts being on Thursdays attracting people versus Fridays because basically it is kind of like the Friday is so busy anyways that it's actually pretty much at capacity and it doesn't allow for an increased amount of people to be added to the events because they're already there. So moving on. So the village received feedback from businesses, as Randy said, not just one meeting, not just one email, but over time these added up to the point that we are here tonight. Um, so what we've heard is that restaurants are doing well on non-concert Friday nights with El Fresco. But we've, we've also heard is that they are experiencing parking issues. The Vail Street garage fills up. People are not able to make their reservations. I've heard from many people about these frustrations on social media. Um, and then, so that's pretty consistent. Um, we've also heard from businesses adjacent to the concert area who want to book their own events on Friday nights, but they can't because of sound conflicts with Sound of Summer. Um, as far as the crowd impacts, we've heard from businesses that wait times at adjacent restaurants could be an hour, an hour and a half, and guests are submitting their names to all of the restaurants and waiting for the first one to call them. And they're experiencing a lot of um, frustration and confusion when it comes to seating and calling people and not getting through and then having to call the next people and they're not there. So it's because of these excessive wait times and it's it's been expressed to us that it's happening on Fridays more so than Thursdays. Um, another issue is bathroom overuse. We've received complaints from businesses about Friday events. We've received them on Fridays, so that's what we're going off of, um, that cause the overuse of bathrooms from sounds of summer guests that are actually not restaurant patrons. So that's just some of the feedback that we've gotten that has um, made us consider this potential change. Um, in addition to the businesses, we have staff impacts. So um, we are always looking at crowd management. Harmony Park is confined and crowds have outgrown the space and, and they continue to. Um, the accessibility, we are um, working on trying to get every person, every age, every ability to be able to have access to this event. Um, it can be a challenge when there's so many people and it blocks sidewalks, it blocks or the crowds block handicap accessibility. So this is a, a challenge. Um, it's also a challenge just having the back-to-back -back event days in the evenings, um, on-site police management, um, on Thursday and Friday evenings, it, or just regular management, um, on Thursday and Friday evenings continues to increase, and it impacts a lot of different departments. So you have increased police presence. I'm sure that you've seen our officers down there, if you've been down there. Um, fire, as of last year, we had um, an a, a, um, a staff person from FIRE assigned to each event. Um, Public Works is working all the time out there. They have to be out there to lift the signs at 2 p.m. that say no seating because there's already a line of people waiting to put their chairs down. Um, and then village administrative staff. Um, and then also the impacts we've heard from Public Works about the back-to-back -back impact just on the grass and the systems at Harmony Park. Um, and another issue or um, thing that we're just looking at when we're looking at everything is that the stage is 
delivered on Thursday and picked up on Friday. It is left under it's left unattended Thursday night into Friday at Harmony Park, and we you know um, we have eyes on it, but it's it's there, so it's it's something to think about. So here are a few examples of crowd issues associated with Friday nights at Sounds of Summer. So this information actually comes from a police department crowd assessment that they did last year. This was during Friday, July 7th concert of Billy Elton. Um, they manually counted the crowd and determined that there was approximately 1,800 people excluding seated restaurant patrons. And those were the people that were actually just there in the concert space in that aerial view. And, um, and also, it was kind of drizzling that day. So you can kind of add to that. Um, at 6.20 PM, the Vail Street parking structure was at capacity. So here's a couple of images from that police assessment. Um, basically, past the Jersey barrier, um, south on Vail, um, if an impromptu seating area popped up because there was just nowhere else for people to sit. Um, there were approximately 110 spectators seated outside the south entrance. They were exposed to um, traffic, so we ended up having to use village vehicles um, just south of the crosswalk to make sure that incoming traffic into the Vale Street garage that was heading north on Vale um, had a barricade in between um, the spectators. Here's an, 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 like another view of that. As you can see, we originally parked north of the crosswalk. That didn't work out. Um, the following week, we started parking south of the crosswalk. And we are creating solutions along the way. Um, so we're doing what we can. As you can see on the left, we had a lot of um, complaints that people couldn't access the park, couldn't get out of the park. They couldn't. Once they were in there, they said that they couldn't use the sidewalks. So then we worked with Public Works, and we got um, the sidewalk spray paint chalk. And that seems to be a very um, effective way of self-policing the crowd. They kind of, like, we'll be there, and we'll see somebody, like, inch up to the white mark. And then, be, OK, that's where we'll sit. Um, another um, improvement we made this year is that we removed the alfresco fencing along um, Harmony Park on Vale Street, and we expanded outdoor seating, and that is also at capacity. So what does all of this mean? Um, in reviewing all of the concerns that we've heard from business and staff, the Village Board is being asked to consider the potential of moving Sounds of Summer to Thursday nights only and extending the season from June through August while maintaining the same number of concerts. So instead of starting mid-June and going six weeks, or seven weeks, but we don't have a concert during Frontier Days. So instead of having six weeks of two concerts through July, we would actually start earlier in June on the first Thursday and then extend through August. And we would still skip the Frontier Days 4th of July week. And then we've had this question, why Thursdays? Um, restaurants have asked that if we could move Sounds of Summer to a different night because Fridays are not the night when they need help drawing crowds. Um, we did consider Wednesdays, however, the Park District hosts, hosts concert on Wednesdays, and they are looking to expand these events in future years. Wednesdays would potentially negatively impact downtown residents on a midweek night. And Thursdays are already part of the Sounds of Summer lineup. So it's the least amount of potential change. So who provided feedback on the proposed summer, Sounds of Summer schedule? Um, we met with all of our village departments, and we checked with them, is this something that you would be up for and interested in? Would this hurt your um, staff or help your staff? And every, all of the departments said that this would work for them. Downtown, the Downtown Arlington Heights Business Association, or DABA, has been consulted with no negative pushback. Um, we consulted with several different businesses on individual basis. The Arlington Economic Alliance um, provided unanimous support, and village staff shared on um, a downtown resident virtual call, and the idea was met with no negative pushback. Are there any increased costs associated with the Thursday-only concert? There is a $3,000 cost increase over two years for the stage. Currently, it we pay one load-in, load-out fee per week. We would be then having to pay that 
per week for 12 weeks instead of once per week for six weeks, or once, yeah, once per week for six weeks. Um, so then this would increase to 12 weeks of load in, load out. And if it moved forward or if, if we went with this, it, this is what our Sounds of Summer would look like. We would start on June 6th um, and then move through all the way down through 829 and then get ready for Harmony Fest. So today, um, we're definitely open to all of your questions, um, but there's a motion to direct staff to move Sounds of Summer to Thursday nights, um, June through August, as a recommendation. Mr. Eccles. If I could, um, Avis, could you go back to the one slide that showed the difference between Thursday and, and Friday? I can. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to show you this. This is new technology we have. We've been hearing for many years from certain restaurants that, you know, they, the, they didn't need the help on Friday. And this was very interesting to us when we saw this in terms of, of raw numbers, that <clears throat> in terms of providing help to the businesses, that we actually, you know, this really demonstrated that anecdotal information we've been hearing for years, that in terms of bang for our buck, in terms of bringing folks downtown, in terms of bringing customers to, to restaurants' doors, we are getting more bang for a buck with the Thursday concert than we are with a Friday concert with this. And, and I thought that this was very interesting to see that because um, that it really reinforced, it showed that the restaurant um, owners kind of know their business um, because it, it was interesting to see this you know, with data. But I, I want to just reiterate that. Now, I know we've thrown a lot of information at you. And again, this is just a recommendation. Um, it's important, as Diana mentioned, for you guys to understand that staff takes this event these events very seriously. And we take a lot of pride in its success and the impact on the downtown and the community as a whole. And it's one of those things that we know makes the community special. Um, we give it a lot of thought and effort every year and, and this recommendation is no different. But the main thing I really wanna leave you with is we ask that we please do make a decision tonight, whatever that decision is, whether it's to stay with the status quo or to move forward with this recommendation. Um, we are running out of time to be, we really need to begin soliciting for sponsors for 2024 and um, we need to start signing bands because that's getting to be a more and more competitive process um, uh, over the years. But with that, we're happy to answer any questions that the, the board may have. Okay, thanks, Randy. Uh, my only question to start things off is it, what, if we were to decide on a one-year trial run for this staff proposal, uh, is there any negative side effects to that in terms of initial outlay of funds uh, or you know, are we losing any money if we do that? <clears throat> our, you know, the, the budget for Arlington Alfresco is, is about, it's a little over $100,000. I'm not for Arlington Alfresco, I'm sorry, for Sounds of Summer is, is about $100,000. And so um, the amount that we're talking about with changing the, the um, uh, it's about $3,000. That's spread over over two years. two years. So it's a that's a pretty small expense in terms of the overall cost of of um, Sounds of Summer. You know, if on the flip side we were going to expand the number of concerts, that would be a pretty dramatic increase in expense. Um, and so no, we don't feel that that would be an issue. I think the only downside of changing the schedule too many times is I think people get used to um, a schedule and get used to concerts being on certain nights. And so, um, you know, if, if we really felt that what we tried didn't work, absolutely we could change it, but we wouldn't recommend kind of just changing it willy nilly, you know, every year because people would kind of lose track of when they are. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Questions or comments from the board? Trustee Tenalia. Thanks, Mary Hayes. Well, thanks again to all of you for working hard on this. Uh, you probably remember I, I spoke about this several times in meetings that we had and there's a handful of reasons that I brought it up, um, and you hit on most of them. And the idea that <clears throat> it's, it's good to help bring in people on off nights. And this AI program that you discovered and presented here tonight is interesting to see that it's, that's right. And it's a little scary <laughs> to think about Creepy. that they know all this, but it's the technology that we live in and the world we live in today. Um, but it proves a point and a thought that it's more beneficial and we're not the only co communities going through this learning process. Um, you guys all know that I play out in our band and we do these things. There's not another community that I'm aware of that does it on a Friday night or Saturday night. It's 
almost always a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, and they do it for the exact same reason. It gives the community something to do in the middle of the week. And if they happen to have a community like ours where these wonderful restaurants available, it helps those folks bring in customers on and off night. So to me, this makes a lot of sense. And the one item that you didn't talk about that I think you're going to hopefully benefit from if you were going to hire Mike and Joe or Rod Tough Curls in the Bench Press or Hillbilly Rockstars or any of those wonderful bands, you're going to get a better price on them on a Thursday night than you're going to get on a Friday night or Saturday night. So that $3,000 extra cost that you might have in this program, I have a feeling you'll, you'll benefit more than $3,000 over 12 concerts. Because, as most bands, they'll, they'll do rehearsals on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. But if there's a paying gig available, they'll go do that. Mm -hmm. And they'll rather market that band at any place that they can get the most money that they can. And it's always a Friday or a Saturday. So the bands that are out playing all the time, they're playing four, five, six nights a week. Those are their full-timers. That's all they do for their careers. Then there's other bands that play just Saturdays and Fridays. And they're working a regular job during the week. I, I just am confident. I'm confident that this will help in so many ways. And I don't think it will upset the apple cart too terribly because it's still Thursday. And people are used to Thursday. Fridays, if they come down, they'll go to any one of our dozen wonderful restaurants and maybe experience some music at Hainani or at the Metropolis Ballroom because there's a wedding. Whatever it is, there's plenty. Ale House, right? Plenty of other things to do on a Friday night. I feel like this is a great solution for a lot of different reasons, and I think it's not a horrible negative change. So I'm, I'm full support of this, especially if you want to try it for just a year, see how it goes. We can always revisit it, but I think it's a great step in the right direction. Thanks for the work. Okay, anybody else? Just swing back. Thank you, Mayor. No, I would agree wholeheartedly with uh, Trustee Tanaya. Um, I was going to ask you, Avis, because you, you had indicated that there was an, an added cost for the uh, pick up and drop off of the stage. But I'm assuming you see a, a difference in price, like Trustee Tanaya said. D do you know what the savings would be to just have it on a Thursday with booking those bands versus booking them on a Friday? I don't know exactly what um, they would quote on a Thursday versus a Friday. Um, I haven't experienced, maybe, I think maybe that might be a little bit more true to like a Tuesday maybe, but I haven't experienced the bands that we've been looking at. At the difference? There's not that much of a difference when it comes to actually like the booking price. Okay. Well, and, and not booking the larger scale bands on, on a Sounds of Summer Night either. That may apply more to like harmony fast bands. Okay. And, 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 and again, the two main reasons for having events like this, mm -hmm. and, and I've talked over the years about um, towns like what I'm familiar with up in Michigan, where they try and have something every month. Uh, it, it offers something really nice not only to the residents, but, but people coming in to take part in those events. Uh, so it offers that nice event to our residents and perhaps people from sounding, surrounding communities, but it's driving business. And, and those are the two big reasons why we want to do it. And if it's bringing people into our downtown and driving business and having something nice for our residents, and we've, we've covered that. Uh, so I, I'd certainly be in favor of, of trying it on, on, for 12 events on Thursday. Uh, I think one of the toughest things for people in general, because as it was said earlier, we've gotten a tremendous amount of emails on this, on this subject, is change. Nobody likes change. That's why they offer change management courses in, uh, at the college level and, and grad school. It's very hard for people to accept change, and I think if we try it, I think it'll be successful, and it's, if it's not, we can discuss a plan again for the following year. So I'm all in favor of it. Okay. Trustee Labadz. Thank you. Um, I have to say, 
you know, I we've talked about this before and all that, but once I really started reading through this, I actually kind of conflicted about it. And the reason why is I'm taking off my trustee hat and I'm putting on just my plain old resident who has a job and has to get up and go to work on Friday morning. I'm much less likely to come to a concert on a Thursday night. Now, I realize the numbers show that a lot of people do, but um, that's why Friday is, you know, to me, a preferable night. And like I said, I'm just talking as a resident, no, without considering any skin in the game that I have here as a trustee. So, so that's why I'm kind of conflicted by it. And I think you've done a great job laying everything out. And um, I suppose I'd be willing for, for a, a trial, but that, that is a concern of mine in that it will mean that there are people who, who love to come to the concerts but can't come on a Thursday night and so will not be <coughs> able to do, to do that. So I just wanted to express that. I do have a question. Um, you didn't happen to get data from the placer AI about Saturday nights and and in terms of numbers of people in the downtown? Well, actually, um, we have one, we have a couple more charts, um, just in case you asked. Um, oh, good. So, <laughs> I, you know, I think that came to us, but I couldn't find it. So. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, this is an example. These bar charts represent Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. So we were really focused on Thursdays and Fridays in this. However, you can see where the Saturdays um, go up and down. So you can see actually Saturday is king through July through September, um, but Fridays are, are the highest um, attended during Sounds of Summer. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. I just wanted to have an idea of what um, the presence of people was like on a Saturday when they're just come, mostly coming out for dinner or they're going to a show at Metropolis or Hainani or something like that. So. Yeah, through Alfresco, after Sounds of Summer, it looks like they always break the 4,000. Okay. Then the last thing I... Um, was just wondering about going into, what was the last date that, because uh, it was going all the way through August. August 29th, for the, I believe. For the proposal, yeah. you know, I, I don't have kids in school anymore, but it seems to me from my neighbors that kids are back in school by the middle of August. So mm -hmm. I suppose that would have some kind of an impact of people being available. District 25 is going back a little bit later this year because they're trying to work around their construction season, so it's probably right around that time. Um, the other thing that, that I think has an impact, too, you know, we're seeing is uh, when colleges go back, and, and that's usually yeah. a little bit different. Yeah. Well, okay. So you do see an impact of fewer college students? But potentially, but we think that, you know, we're still seeing, you know, we still see interest in going through August till around the time that school goes back in. And, and that's right around the same time. Okay. Well, I will say that it does feel when it ends, I'm always sad. It's like, I mean, this is just July. There's a lot of summer left. So, yeah. So yeah, I can see that. All right. Well, I just want to express my confliction here <laughs> and and why I, I feel that way so but thanks for all the work and all the data that you've provided just to address uh, your point Robin about uh, people not wanting to to come down um, on a weeknight when they've got work the next day I think I agree with that analysis if it was on Monday Tuesday or Wednesday I think you're seeing more people now really starting their weekend on Thursday Thursday night, and so especially with COVID, where you and I have both seen nobody go, takes the train downtown on Friday anymore because they're already working from home and they've already kind of switched into weekend mode already. And so that's why Thursday night makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, I, I think it's uh, really started to become more of a weekend night and uh, it just makes more sense. And I, I, I really agree with the staff proposal on that. So Trustee Shirley. Um, you know, I want to just piggyback on what Robin said. Um, I, I just feel like the weekend starts Friday afternoon at 3.30. I'm going to represent the blue-collar crowd. I, I understand that a lot of people are not working five days a week, but those of us that have to actually go to the office or have to do some kind of manual labor, our weekend doesn't start till 3.30 on Friday afternoon. So 
I think that we're missing the resident input that I would have liked to have a little bit more completely in this, this equation. Um, because I just think that more families enjoy this and we're not really taking into account that issue that, that Thursday nights are not an option for everybody. Uh, whether it be families who um, have activities um, or daycare or whatever it might be on Fridays. But I just, I just think we're kind of missing things. And so I, I really appreciate all the, the back, uh, background work that was done by staff, but I'm, I'm reluctant to change things right now. I think we should go uh, another season the way it is now and solicit input from residents and visitors to downtown in a more complete fashion for a year before we make this decision. So that's kind of where I am right now is I would not vote in favor of this motion as it stands right now. Trustee Grassi. Oh, thank you. I want to thank you for the work you put into this. And I sure, uh, I, I do agree with Trustee Labeds where, where I'm torn between this too, because, you know, I, I walk down both Thursday and Friday nights to both shows uh, from where I live and I love it. Uh, but I also walk down when there aren't concerts. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I definitely want to hear more from some of the residents. Um, but I am conflicted with this too, but I completely understand from the trustee position and the staff position and the importance of, of the businesses being able to, to have what they need for, for the weekends too, as well as the staff. So I, I hear all of that. Um, and then I was also thinking what, what kind of possible compromises we're trying to kind of figure some of this out. Um, would it be something that people might be willing to do Thursday nights in June and August? We would have three Fridays in July. See how that works and compare it. I, I'm just trying to think of some possible compromises while you're planning things out. It would just be three Fridays in July since we have Frontier Days. See if, you know, with more data for next year. Just wanted to toss out a kind of compromise. But then I also wanted to mention something that Trustee Tenalia mentioned before that I also would be interested for the staff to look into is a permanent stage here. And how would that change some of what we can offer, especially if we move to Thursday night concerts to, to think of what other smaller sort of activities could happen on Friday night for the community. We have such a special thing. We have people coming from all over, not just Arlington Heights, wanting to be a part of this community place, gathering place downtown. It is something special. But it doesn't necessarily always have to be a concert. I mean, I, I'm thinking, could it be yoga in the park on Friday nights? We have so many businesses who maybe might want to lead something. We have maybe art in the park or a dance class in the park that wouldn't be as big a crowd, but could be still something for people and families to gather on a Friday night. So I'm just tossing out some things I've been thinking of, too. But I really thank you um, for the work you put into this. And I would like to hear more, more um, thoughts from staff and residents. Trustee Bertucci. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, I agree with where Robin was going and then also even further where um, Trustee um, Scott Shirley was going. I think that somebody has to acknowledge the many emails that we got. And these are the more the family work night kind of scenarios, OK? They may not be packing this room, but I mean, we all got a lot of emails. And I know, staff, you did too. I, I don't know if you want to actually acknowledge it or not, but there are a lot of residents out there who are saying that on Thursday nights, I can't always get there because it's a work night or there's activities or whatever. But Friday nights is when I best am able to, to make it. And I think we have to um, think about that and, and try to accommodate the residents too who are trying to enjoy with their tax paying dollars, where their tax paying dollars go. Um, so I, I, I am in support of keeping the Friday, but I do have some other questions, okay. Um, one of those questions being is um, the, you also didn't mention that a previous trustee, past trustee, who was the, what I would, I would say many of us in the community who've been around a long time would call him the dean of the Sounds of Summer, um, Steve Dady. Did, did, we, what, did we talk to Steve at all? Other than to say, from what my understanding is, is we almost went to Steve and said, this is what we're doing. But did we take his opinion? He's the one that got the bands. He's the one that got this started. He was the, the one that started it with a, from a napkin so to speak, 
And how did we approach Steve on this? Because that, I think, is also important and created um, uh, a lot of the so-called public uproar. If I, I can address Go that. Ahead, Mr. Uh, you, you know, uh, Mr. Steve, you know, who I, I know well, um, you know, he was very involved in Sounds of Summer, as you said, from the beginning, and was quite involved until a few years ago. And he, he really hasn't been involved in Sounds of Summer for a handful of years. And so we, you know, he's not involved any longer in picking the bands. He's not involved any longer in logistics. That's something that was transferred to staff a few years back um, when he took a step back. Um, to, to be candid, this wasn't something that um, he was consulted with because he's taken a step back. Um, this was something, as, as you know, originated from comments from the business community, comments from some of the trustees, and um, from some of our own analysis, but it wasn't something, you know, we, we brought this up to you guys over a couple of meetings once in May um, and, and uh, once in, uh, in November, and, and that's been kind of where the conversation has sat um, since then. See, and that's, and that's where I feel that sometimes um, we forget about those who help build our community. And just because he's not involved anymore, he, it would have been nice, I think, to have um, sat down with Steve and get, got his opinion. Um, he certainly, certainly is passionate about it now. If, if you've talked to him or read anything that he's written, he's passionate about Fridays staying. Um, so I, I, think, I think in some ways that's, that's a concern. My other, some of my other questions are is this idea of the parking and the bathrooms. What have we done as far as communications to move people away from using the bathrooms? What have we done to help that? And my other question with that is the parking garages. What's going on is do we have, we don't have, I know we don't have full capacity at Evergreen parking. And how is some of the other parking garages on these Fridays? So I've shared pictures on social media of saying there's a Sounds of Summer band going on and Vale Street Garage is full, but check out this lot just south of Village Hall. It's empty. It's just a four-minute walk. Like So we're, we are pushing that message out. Um, ultimately, people are just want to park as close as possible to everything. Um, so that remains a message that we're, we're going to continue to um, push out. What well, are the, what I, are don't, the, the I don't know that that should be a reason, though, to say that Friday should be taken away because we're not doing a good job of communicating and getting people to move towards some of those other garages. If, if I could, you know, one of the issues that we experience on Friday, too, um, kind of an anecdote is uh, Metropolis Ballroom, you know, frequently has uh, weddings and, and so forth on Fridays. And one of the practices that we engage in is we will, just because otherwise th their wedding patrons would, and I'm sure Mr. Benetti can speak to this better than more eloquently than I am about to, um, we have to set aside parking spaces, sometimes 50 parking spaces in the garage for wedding patrons. And so that creates a conflict that exists on, on Fridays, but not on Thursdays. And I, and I can tell you that our communication on the parking issue um, I don't believe this is an issue of communication. I think it's more of an issue of just sheer numbers and logistics that, you know, we're, we are on those Friday nights, we're hitting, we're hitting, you know, a lot, our, our limits in terms of capacity. And you can see it in terms of both where people are sitting, but also in terms of uh, where folks are parking. Now, eventually, um, you, know, you keep that up, more people will walk. People are parking in the neighborhoods. They are doing those things. A lot of the people that are coming are coming from out of town. They may not, you know, think that there won't be parking right front and center. And so they get there and they just kind of drive around until they find something. Um, we're just pointing it out as a challenge on Friday. Um, we're not saying that that in and of itself is a reason to move the concert series. Like I said, some of this came from, from um, the board um, wanting to explore uh, alternative, alternative nights. But we're saying that it does, it is a factor in terms of, the challenge of managing a, a, a Friday night event versus a Thursday night event. Why, why, is our, why is success, though, being, for lack of better words, punished, so to speak? So, we, we, so Fridays are successful, and it's working out great. And yeah, we are at capacity, but OK. So I, I don't see the problem. What's, what's the problem with that? Well, you know, I think we're not saying there's a problem. What we're saying is that the businesses are saying that, and, and the data shows 
that Friday nights are doing pretty well as they are. And so to the extent that the purpose, one of the purposes of the event is to try to help out businesses, what we're hearing from restaurants, for many of the restaurants are, they're doing just fine on Fridays. They'd love to see, as Trustee Tanaya said, more business on some of these other nights. And so we kind of tested that hypothesis by looking at the, the data, and the data seemed to support the anecdotes that we're seeing that if you throw an event on Thursday, you get more peop more extra people than you do on, on a Friday. Is that so, a reason not to do it? Not necessarily, but it, that, that's, like I said, you know, uh, ultimately this is up to you guys. Can you show me that slide? Sure. So you're saying that to go from non-sounds of summer Friday of 3,755 to 5,034 with a 34% increase is not, is, is insignificant. Not all. I'm just saying it's less than 93% in 1,800. Well, well, that's a, th a Thursday. But th we're still drawing in more people on Fridays sure. with sounds of summer. And I'd, say, I'd call that a significant increase. So I call I, Thursday phenomenal, right? I, I would agree. Okay. So, I, I, again, I think there's there's a lot of reasons, um, and I'm still gonna I'm <clears throat> I'm one to always kind of watch out for the the local resident and and some of the concerns they have. Um, there we've heard from a lot of them. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with uh, with with Scott on this and say there's uh, somebody's got to stand up for that family that wants to come on a Friday night because Thursday nights just don't work for whatever reason um, because they're working family people. All right, Trustee Dennington. Thank you. Um, I, I do agree that there are a good amount of families that do want to use sound or do want to enjoy sounds of summer on Friday nights. Um, you know, people with young families that aren't going to go to a bar and they're, you know, they're not going to buy, they're not going to be at Ale House or, or probably Hey Nani, but this is a, a great free activity that they can enjoy on a Friday night. Um, I too was looking for some different compromise because we did hear from a lot of residents that want the Friday. Um, is it a possibility that we could do um, Fridays like just once a month, so like a June, July, August, Friday, and then so there would be three Fridays and then there would be nine Thursdays. Is that something that we could try as kind of a compromise? So I can just kind of say that once you do that, you're, there's going to be a general maybe confusion of what when there is a concert, when there isn't a concert, and to stay with something that is established so everybody knows every Thursday or every Friday or every Thursday and Friday, they know that that's, it's not going to be switching week to week. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's best to stay with something that's consistent that people can plan around. What if it, if it was like the first, the first Friday is the, is the Friday night and then everything else is Thursday? You know, I, I think, I think trustee, I mean, we, we can certainly try anything that the board wants to do, but we're saying that's kind of the, the, the downside is that predictability, but I mean, you know, anything can, can be tried and work. I mean, it's all going to be a pilot project for sure. And bathrooms were brought up. Are residents supposed, which bathrooms should they use? The Metropolis bathrooms or are there ba really bathroom facilities? We, we've, you know, generally speaking, until this has started to happen. We've never had an issue with bathrooms, um, but we're, what we're having to do now um, is have a uh, pay for an extra detail to keep the bathrooms clean at the, uh, um, the Metropolis Theater, kind of in that lobby, because a lot of folks are using that. We're still working with um, the people in the, um, the building adjacent to it, because those building, that those, there's bathrooms kind of in that common area. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, we're hoping to have an agreement with them in the coming year where um, the, the contracting firm that we use for the Metropolis bathrooms will also clean those bathrooms on um, concert nights so that people can, be, can go there. Um, but it's, um, people will tend to go wherever they want to go that we see. And so it's, a, it's an additional um, new logistical issue that, as Trustee Bertu said, we're kind of victims of our own success. We never had to deal with that before. So we're, we're still looking to, for ways to address that. 
Great. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to Trustee Baldino yeah. first. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, you just said it. You know, we just, we are victims of our own success. And I think, I don't think anybody who was on the board during the pandemic when we were talking about El Fresco anticipated that this was going to turn into what it, what it turned into. I'm not saying anything um, crazy here. I think everybody realizes that. Um, we've, we've, there, there's been discussion about all the emails that we got and uh, people um, not wanting the Friday concerts to go away. Um, and I got those emails too. But I got to be honest, the people that I meet face to face and talk to about El Fresco and the Sounds of Summer, a lot of those people say they don't want to be anywhere near downtown Arlington Heights on a Friday or Saturday night. And so for me, um, you know, if we, if, we, if we spread this out a little bit more, spread it out between June and August, for me and move it from Friday to Thursday and and maybe have more people in the middle of the week and less people so having having the area so crowded on a Friday and Saturday night that's not necessarily a bad thing for me um, you can probably tell I, I don't have a really strong preference for Friday or Thursday night on the concerts um, staff is recommending we go to Thursday. It seems to me that that would spread the crowd out a little bit more, make it a little bit more accessible to, to folks. Uh, I get it, there are concerns, but um, first of all, it's a good problem to have um, because this has become a thing. Uh, the question that I'm wrestling with is that when we started this, we did not want this to turn into Mardi Gras. And I think I said that at one of the meetings when we were talking about El Fresco. Well, it's turned into Mardi Gras. Uh, and it's become unwieldy. Um, and I, I, I guess the bottom line is that I'm going to support the staff recommendation to sp try and spread this out a little bit because uh, um, it has become so unwieldy and it's become, become a problem. And I don't know where this is going to go two years down the road. If we try this for a year and it doesn't work, well, then we'll try something else. That was always the attitude with Al Fresco in this whole downtown experience. But I would just submit that it's turned into something that we did not anticipate. It's not necessarily a bad problem to have because it's been so successful and it's brought so many people here to Arlington Heights. But it's getting a bit unwieldy in my opinion. Thank you, Mayor. I think everybody had a first chance. So Trustee Bertucci. A couple of things. I think that many of the things, you know, are can be overcome. I mean, the bathroom issue could be simply overcome by just ordering some porta potties. Um, and I think that's gotta be considered. Um, I would disagree with Trustee Baldino because I am there probably the majority of Thursdays and Fridays. And I would call those very comfortable. I mean, are some of them Friday nights a little bit more crowded? Yes. But I would never say that we're, we have an issue. We have smiling police officers talking to children and that type of thing. There is, there is nothing unwieldy about those crowds on, on, on Friday night. Um, and um, and I, like I said, I, I talk to a lot of families that both live down there and live in other places, and I'm at most of those Thursdays and Fridays. I, if many of you, when you're down there, you'll see me down there. Um, and I live down there. Um, so I, I would disagree on, on that count. Okay, Trustee Tanaya. Yeah, I'm, and, and I don't wanna make a big debate about this, my, my position. I'm, I'm comfortable to do whatever. This is not something that I'm, you know, firm, oh my gosh, we have to change things. That's not my perspective at all. But I would say the thing that is for certain is change. When this, when Steve, and Steve is a dear friend, and he's a brilliant man, and he's thought about this more than any of us could imagine, I'm sure. But Arlington Heights, our downtown district has evolved and changed so much from what it was when he first developed his his initial idea about all this. And we needed 
something like Steve's ideas to help bring people downtown. And it worked. Lo and behold, it worked. And it just grew and it got bigger and better and better. And the same thing happened now for El Fresco. We, we needed a rescue plan. And we threw out a lot of different ideas to try and make it. And with everybody's help, it became this wonderful thing. So now we have these two wonderful things happening in our downtown. And it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. And a lot of towns would love to have our problem. Sincerely, it's, we're blessed. We're blessed to have what we have. So maybe there's room for a little bit of change and a little bit of adjustment here. And I think that's all we're talking about. There are some businesses here that I want to hear from. There are some people who this affects pretty intensely. And, and so um, maybe, maybe that's where we need to go with this dialogue next. Yeah, I do want to get to the audience, but go ahead, Trustee, a little bit. Uh, just a, a quick question. Um, if we were to go, you know, uh, let me backtrack slightly. Part of the draw are the specific bands, like the Blues Brothers, for example. It's the one that comes to my mind. Um, and those happen to be on Friday nights. Um, my question is, uh, are they also likely to be available on a Thursday night if we go to this model? I mean, because the bands are part of it. The bands are a lot of the draw. Absolutely. I think um, that's the importance of making that decision today. Absolutely. Because we need to start making those plans. Um, I'm in contact with the bands. They're all kind of on hold. They kind of understand. Um, usually around five or six fan favorites we bring over to each season. If there's a rain out from the previous year, knock on wood, there hasn't been that many, we would bring them over as well to this year. So that leaves about five or six bands um, that we are able to like book new each year. So um, we do have a little bit of flexibility there. We're always looking for the bigger bands. We do have a certain criteria that we look for in bands to try to bring in the bigger crowds. Um, so yes, um, I don't think it, I think it just has to do with the band and their schedule and their booking. Every band is different. But there would be interest from those oh, um, Friday night bands on a, for a Thursday. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I, I was going to say, you know, the previous communities that I worked for had concert series, and as Trustee Tanai said, never on a Friday. Um, they were during the middle of the week. Um, because the event ends at 830 it's not a late night. It's not like a Harmony Fest type, you know, all night thing. It's something that that folks go to. And he's correct that that these types of festivals, on, even on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, are not uncommon. And and there are bands that that do that. Um, and um, it's it's a different feel than a Friday night. But that was always kind of the idea is that is to perhaps get people um, have a night out that um, you know gives them a reason to do something, go out and get get a, a meal and see, listen to some music for a little bit on a night they wouldn't normally. Okay, thank you. Okay. I do have uh, one blue card, but I'm sure there's others who want to talk about this as well. So the first is Ernie Rose. Ernie? Hope you guys got dinner before we got here. <laughs> uh, I'm Ernie Rose, for those I haven't met. Um, I'm the managing partner at DKMO Law. Chip is off skiing today, so I'm the designated representative from the uh, newly formed downtown Arlington Heights Business Alliance. And I just want to provide some feedback on the discussions that we've had with the village staff in some of our meetings. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of our group. If you've met with downtown business owners, and most of you have, we are not a monolith. There are people who want concerts on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. There are people who want concerts every day of the week. I can't tell you what every business wants. What I can tell you is the feedback we've got from our businesses when presented with the options that the village staff has given us, namely uh, it's kind of a Thursday, Friday option or a Friday uh, or a thurs Thursday only option or a Thursday, Friday option. Um, it, let me tell you a, a little bit about our group. Um, we've, we've regularly got 10 to 15 members attending. We're small. We're getting bigger. We've got more members joining all the time. We have a lot of members uh, uh, in near proximity to Harmony Park. And those are the people that, with all due respect to all my other friends and business owners around the community, there are a lot of issues that affect everyone. This is very much an issue that affects them in ways that it does not affect other business owners. So this is important to them. Um, the businesses that I've spoken with, let me give you a, kind of the list here. Uh, I've spoken specifically with 
uh, Beer on the Wall, Bottle and Bottega, Hey Nani, DKMO Law, Scratchboard Kitchen, Peggy Canane's, Coco Bloom Blue, Eiffel, Ta- Eiffel Flower, 44 Vale, Salsa 17. All those businesses uh, support this plan. Um, in all of our meetings, we've had three meetings with village staff where we've discussed this. I held another Zoom meeting before. I knew you guys were getting a lot of emails and calls. I wanted to give our businesses one more chance to speak out. No business has spoken out against this plan when the question is, do we do Thursday only or do we do Thursday and Friday? All those businesses support Thursday only, at least trying it out to see if it works. Uh, I won't speak for Tom. I know he's got other concerns. The Metropolis Ballroom has been hit hard uh, by Thursdays and Fridays, but Fridays especially. Uh, and that's another consideration that we have. So everybody on our side um, th- that I've spoken with thinks this is a sensible plan. And that's it, all that's to say, if you guys said we're going to do 24 concerts or 36 concerts, we'd love it. Avis would kill me for saying that, but um, we'd love it. And so if you want to give us more, we'll take it. But if you're presenting those two options, the businesses we've spoken with, uh, they support this plan. I also want to thank the village staff. I think that there's been a lot of, I've seen a lot of misinformation on the internet in the last few days. And it's, it's very disappointing. Um, I think there's a lot of people that think you're cutting back to six concerts and doing Thursdays only. I don't think they realize you're adding six concerts. I've seen surveys that if you take them and you don't read the memo from the village, if you just take the survey, you think they're getting rid of uh, six concerts. And that's not useful information. I'd be mad too um, if I thought you were cutting back on the concerts. It's extremely popular. Um, so we're in support of this plan. Uh, it's sensible. It's worth trying. Like most of you, uh, like uh, Trustee Tonelli said, this isn't life or death. I mean, this is, it seems like a good idea. We could go the other way, but this is sensible. They have good reasons. And the, the primary reasons we care about, I was going to give you a theoretical reason why, you know, Thursday business is better for our businesses than Friday business. We see that. This is what Chip has been screaming for years and years. We need to draw people in on non-peak nights because Fridays are going to be busy. Um, I talked to uh, Beer on the Wall today, and they said they can't, you know, the Metropolis bathrooms are one thing. I can't even get my kids in there. Try taking a three- and a five-year-old on a Friday night into the Metropolis bathrooms. It's a mess. Um, But you try uh, Beer on the Wall. They can't keep their bathrooms clean because people just come in and use them whenever they want. And that doesn't mean we don't want business. We want more business. We want everybody down there. But if we have the opportunity to spread that out a little bit, um, we think that's a good thing. So, and I can't help but say again, I mean, I know Tom would prefer a Wednesday only schedule. I don't think that that's on the table listening to all of you. It's tough. He's in a, he's in a hard position with Friday night concerts. I mean, Thursday nights too. He'll tell you that too. But Friday nights, try having a wedding on a Friday night with concerts going on in the summer. His business is in the summer. So there's some folks affected. Um, We appreciate you all listening. And again, we've been building a relationship with the village. We're small. They show up with two people at all of our meetings to listen to 10 to 15 business owners because we've invited them in um, and they've built, they've spent the time and we've done some sparring. There's a lot of stuff we don't agree to. And I suspect we'll be back in a few months asking for more money because we want more events and we want more things throughout the year. We want the downtown to be central, but um, they're making the effort. They're talking to us. And the idea that this was short-sighted, uh, I, frankly, that's silly because they've been, they've been thinking about this for a long time. And that doesn't mean you got to agree with them. That's a great thing about this place is you all sit up there and respectfully agree, uh, agree and disagree. Uh, but, but they're trying hard. They're listening and, and we appreciate their engagement. So thanks. All right. All right. Sure, go ahead. Question. Okay, so Mr. Rose, I just wanted to ask some questions because I did talk to some of the restaurants and business owners down there also. And is Armin's part of your group? They're, I think they're members. I don't have the membership in front of me. They're members. They don't attend all of our meetings. So, okay. So I, I won't speak on their behalf. Okay. Well, I, I happen to have talked to them, and, and they are fine with, with Fridays. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not speaking for them. Okay. I'm only speaking for the so folks you that only So you only talked about those that support I, I'm not going to speak on behalf okay. of anybody I haven't okay. talked to. Okay. How about Carlos and Carlos? They don't okay. attend our meetings. Okay. I, I talked to them. How about Cortland's? Uh, Cortland's is in our group. I haven't talked to them about this okay. particular I've, issue. I've all talked to the, the – how about Big Shot Piano Bar? Uh, Larry? I haven't, Larry's never showed up to a meeting. Okay. I've yeah. talked to him and he's – By the way, they all get our meeting minutes, and this was mentioned. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating your meeting. I'm just asking if, yeah. if you know what their position is on nope. Friday. Nope. Only the people whose names okay. I said. Okay. How about Kilwins? Uh No. They haven't attended our meetings. Okay. But I, I'm not I'm not the, the czar of downtown. Okay. I don't have everybody's. Okay. We can do this all okay. night, but I, only those folks. that I, 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 I just wanted to get a perspective. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ernie. Thanks. All right. That's the only blue card, but I'm sure there's others. So, Tom, Mr. Minetti. Her name just walks through slow these days. 
Take your time. We won't count that against your three minutes. <laughs> I'm Tom Minetti with the Metropolis Ballroom. I appreciate all the comments that I've heard today. Um, I agree with all the comments that you mentioned about the village participating in the conversations we've been having. They've been very instrumental on our decisions and hearing us and discussing with us options and things like that. But things I'm not hearing from the board is how it's negatively impacting businesses or someone else. All I'm hearing about what the success is. The summer series has been a success. I'm not denying that. And we do want that. To me, the definition of success is, as far as a village is concerned, is listening to the businesses and also listening to the residents. Having a compromised medium to make sure no one is hurt by the decisions that are made. Now, I've been there before the summer series started through the whole process. And like some others that have brought up thinking of the future, the what ifs. This is a what if in my in our decision in our uh, business on how it's negatively impacted us as an operation. Um, you could look at the Thursdays, look at the Fridays, and certainly you can walk downtown. Cannot get through some of those crowds. I've showed up in some instances where I was blown away. I said, "How is this allowed?" This is not thought through. You don't have enough bathrooms. You don't have enough security. You don't have enough emergency capabilities to handle these types of crowds in this instance. So what's the end game? How many people can we fit in a, in a street and call that success? Is that the end game? You know, just everyone's having a good time. Everyone is having a good time. But what happens when something goes wrong? We're doing a great job in addressing some of the busing issues. What are we doing about the safety issues of downtown Arlington Heights? Now, this is negatively impacting my business. Who would have a wedding on a Friday night? With that, the sound uh, that's gotten so loud, it's right. Who can deny that? Who's going to have it there? Who's going to make up my income that I'm losing because of this? Put that in part of the budget. Um, I think we're all smart. We are all can think through things here to make it work for everybody. I'm all for doing it on a Wednesday, preferably. I'll settle on a Thursday. Fridays absolutely should not be the case. The businesses don't need it down there. No matter who you talk to, they're already busy. Where is the impact going to be made on an off night? Start talking to them how their Wednesday, how their Thursday is a year from now, how much it's helped. I think you should give this a try in the Thursdays and see how it works out. I appreciate your time tonight. All right. Thanks, Tom. And, and just to address your concern that we haven't been talking about the negative effects, I think it was outlined in the staff rationale. And so I think, you know, acceptance of their proposal would acknowledge the fact that there has been negative impacts yes, on businesses. Yes, absolutely. Again, so I, we I'm, certainly I'm, recognize that. And I appreciate that as well. Right. Yeah. So thank you. All right. Anyone else in the audience? Dave. I guess timing is everything. <laughs> Dave, just give us your name again for the record. Dave Losavio. I am a uh, five-year resident of Metro Lofts, and I want to start off by saying any complaints that happened in my building from the beginning um, when Alfresco started um, and there were bands playing, um, those were far and few between, and that was not the consensus of the building. That was one or two outliers who happened to be right next door to where my door is. And there were other things going on besides it's too loud in downtown Arlington Heights. We have an energy, we have a community, and we have a place why people move here and come here from out of town. I always say it's like Vegas. We get a lot of out-of-towners coming, 
and they do respect the area. So living in that building right there it is a blessing to have this. I will say that every summer I say, wow, it ended really quick. It's already over. All the bands are gone. And I think that spreading it out on Thursdays, in my opinion, not only does it help the businesses that we discussed, but I also think from the residents' point of view, it makes it a little bit more special and we don't take it for granted like it's Thursday and Friday, Thursday, Friday, and then it's done. It's like we're almost looking forward to it more because it's spread out over the summer and it just goes by really fast. And it's like a big energy explosion for two days, I got to say, because I'm walking by this five times a day, every day. Um, and as much as I love it, I actually think it would benefit not just the businesses, but more people would look forward to it being more spread out and only having it once a week versus twice a week. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else in the audience? Seeing none. We'll come back to the board then. Well, I... Um, this is a difficult decision for me just because I enjoy both nights so much. I'm, I'm down there almost every Sound of Summer concert, and so I really enjoy <clears throat> well, the best part of my job, I say it all the time, is the smiles I see on the faces from the people, both at El Fresco and the Sounds of Summer concerts. And so I just very much appreciate how much they enjoy it and how much uh, you know I enjoy giving it to them. But I think this is a reasonable compromise to at least try for one year. And so uh, that would be my suggestion, is that we uh, concur with the staff recommendation for, for one year and see how it goes. I, I do think uh, that the, the community will support an extended Sounds of Summer series uh, through uh, for uh, 12 weeks. Uh, we're not eliminating any concerts. We're still going to have the same number of concerts. But it will satisfy the concern, as I've heard for a long time, that uh, people want to see it go longer. And so uh, to have it go through the end of August, I think, is something that will be very satisfying for uh, many of our residents. And so again, I think this is a reasonable compromise to uh, address all of the concerns and satisfy uh, uh, some of the businesses' concerns as well. So other questions or comments? Trustee Baldino. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just in the interest of moving the topic along, I would like to make a motion. Please. Uh, to move the Sounds of Summer concerts to Thursdays only, June through August, beginning June 2024. Second. Motion by Trustee Baldino, second by Trustee, who was it? You know, these new microphones, I can't tell where the, <laughs> it's coming from. Really. Second. Okay, by <laughs> Trustee uh, <laughs> Twingbeck. Any further discussion? Trustee Tenalia. I, I guess I'm just reiterating. I apologize for that. I, I don't want anybody to walk away from this hearing tonight feeling like we're trying to sell out or sell short on something. I think uh, what Dave said at the end here was important to, to think about. And it is a wonderful thing. And to extend it the whole summer, to me, makes a lot of sense as well. It's not, not, that wasn't even on my radar when I first thought about doing this, but that's just a bonus on it. Now it, it's not just this condensed all in one, hit it really hard for a short period of time. It spreads it out. So I'm in support of this uh, and, and, and giving it a, a try for a year and, and see what happens. Trustee LeBaz. Thank you. Um, I started out by saying that I'm conflicted I can't say that I'm not still conflicted, but I've listened to everybody and all the pros and cons and that sort of thing and the people that have spoken tonight as well as the emails. And I'm, I am willing to give it a try, you know, nothing set in stone. Um, and if we find this doesn't work, who knows? Uh, but I do actually really like the fact that it would go longer. Um, it seems that, you know, July is often vacation time and I miss half the concert. So, um, it will be nice to have it go in, into August. So I'm going to take a deep breath and say, I will support this. <laughs> okay. Trustee Grassi. I, I just wanted to, to mention my appreciation for all the voices shared. I hear the residents who want to keep Fridays. I would like to keep that, but I am willing to try this. Arlington Heights is... 
has proven itself to be so creative and have wonderful things come out of changes that we either didn't expect or want or were a bit of a surprise. So I'm willing to try this for a year. I do appreciate also it being extended. And I also think it's very important, not only we listen to the residents who will have longer period of time for concerts to make the Thursdays work, but to also hear the needs of our businesses in that area. So I'm willing to, to try this for a year also. Okay. Anybody else? Trustee Bertucci. Um, I, you know, my stance. The only thing I would say is, um, in general, I would like to almost, I'd like to find us find a way, fi find the dollars. I'd like to have it extended and Thursday and Friday nights. Um, I think the, the extension into too late into August, I think, may or may not. It'll be interesting to see what kind of crowds we get because as you as school starts, college starts, that type of thing, I think that might be a concern um, about what effect that'll, that'll actually have. But um, I just want to say, I think you take success and what you do is you expand it, not contract it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd almost like to see us uh, maybe maintain the Thursday and Fridays currently and just add in the extra Thursday nights on the tail end. So that's my stance. Okay, anybody else? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Let's take a roll call on this. Trustee Baldino? Yes. Trustee Schwingbeck? Yes. Trustee Grassi? Yes. Trustee Dunnington? Yes. Trustee Shirley? No. Trustee Lebeds? Yes. Trustee Pertucci? No. Trustee Tanaya? Yes. President Hayes? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you for your input and, um, and the staff's hard work on this, uh, Diana and Avis especially. I know uh, you guys are very passionate about this and want to see it be successful for everybody concerned. And so thank you, especially to you guys and, and uh, all the staff for their hard work on this. All right, we have no other business. Anything else under the report of the village manager? Nothing further on that, Adam. Anything from the board under petitions and communication? Seeing now, I'll go back to the village manager for a request to, for a closed session. Thank you, Mayor. I would uh, respectfully request that we enter into closed session for 5 ILCS 120 2 c 21 discussion of minutes lawfully closed, whether for the purposes of approval of the minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes and 5 ILCS 120 2 c 11 litigation when an action against affecting or on behalf of the village has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal or when the board finds that an action is probable or imminent. So moved. Is there a second? Oh. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion by Trustee Tenalia, second by Trustee Labeds. Roll call. Trustee Tenalia? Yes. Trustee Labeds? Yes. Trustee Huntington? Yes. Trustee Schwingbeck? Yes. Trustee Bertucci? Yes. Trustee Grassi? Yes. Trustee Shirley? Yes. Trustee Baldino? Yes. President Hayes? Yes. We are adjourned in the closed session. We'll not be reporting out. Thanks uh, to all of you for joining us tonight.